You're listening to the Veteran Etc. Podcast, as there's always more to be said about a veteran. Join your host, Mike Kim, a veteran, ex-monk, season war trauma therapist, and writer, as he shares his years of research in veteran readjustment culture and the meaning of warrior life. Now, here's your host, Mike Kim. Veteran Etc. This is a show based on not just veteran culture, but veteran readjustment culture, a theory concept that I came up with back in the 90s uh, during my theological and philosophical studies after serving in the military. And uh, I've been focused a lot on not just like the books, magazines, movies, but more on the uh, daily lives of veterans, the intersubjectivity uh, veterans have with the world, as well as deep insights that veterans have after they wear the uniform on society. And uh, we're honored to have Scott Ritter. Scott Ritter, uh, not only does he have a background in uh, foreign affairs and Soviet Union and the and Russia and and the Middle East and and other areas of the world, but he truly uh, understands uh, concepts like conflict resolution. He was um, not only in the Marine Corps over ten years serving in the Marine Corps, but you know he was chief. UN weapons inspector, not only that, mentioned on, on God knows how many different magazines, journals, etc., including being time person of the week. Um, I'm going to let Scott say more about himself, but we're honored to have him here uh, as a warrior, as a veteran, and not just that, but an expert on so many topics. Thanks for being here. Scott. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to talk with you and your audience. Great. So well, can, can you give the audience a, a little bit about, you know, your background? Because it's, uh, you know, uh, pretty, pretty, not only, I would say, intense, but just involved. You know what I mean? Like you, you've been involved, in, you know, from like you know, weapons agreements and, and, you know, nuclear weapons, you know, uh, disarmament, disarmament to, you know, being in combat, you know, like, yeah. Can, can you like. Sure. Um, I think the first thing people have to understand uh, about me, and it, I think it goes into, you know, understanding, you know, who I am and how I became who I am is I, I was born into a military family. Um, you know, so a lot of people who join the military, you know, their first experiences, uh, you know, when they get off the bus and they get on the two yellow footprints, you know, and it's like, bam, there it is. My first experience, I mean, it, from the moment I was born, I was um, involved in the military lifestyle as a dependent, but, you know, it, you live, eat, breathe, sleep, everything is the military. It was it just was second nature to live on a military installation. It was second nature to uh, my father was an Air Force officer to uh, to to live in a uh, an environment where you know military aircraft were taking off in your backyard and landing in your backyard, uh, where everybody your family dealt with was in the military. And you know during the Vietnam War, I grew up during the Vietnam War. Um, my father deployed to Vietnam. My uncle deployed to Vietnam. Everybody we knew deployed to Vietnam. Most of them came home from Vietnam. Some of them came home with drinking problems from Vietnam. Some came home and the families broke up and my friend no longer had a father or a mother because the family broke up. Um, some didn't come home. Some just came home later because their fathers were prisoners of war. This was normal. I mean, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is, you know, when people talk about, you know, assimilating into the reality of, of the military life, there was no assimilation. It was my life. So, um, so you would say, yeah. so this is interesting because I don't think a lot of folks know that about you. And so I'd like to ask you this because we have active duty and we have veterans, but we also have civilians who, who were uh, 
you know, family members tied to the military. So do you do you believe, you know, family members are also deeply affected by uh, the service of of the uh, of of the of the main you know of, of of the main family member in in the military. One hundred. Look, I have three sisters. None of them served in the military. All of them are deeply impacted by the life they led uh, you know, as the dependents of a of a career military officer, and by having their brother serve in the military. Uh, one of them married a a, 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 a military officer uh, herself, and so. You know, the, the, the fact of the matter is the military experience um, isn't just for the person who wears the uniform. It's for the people who are in that family unit. Uh, that, is, that is an experience, too. And it's an experience that is so foreign from what mainstream America. But, and I'm not denigrating. Look, I, I'm not tr trying to say that we had it bad, you had it better. I'm saying it was different. Whatever you had, the good, the bad, and the ugly, was 100% different from what I had, the good, bad, and the ugly. It doesn't make one better or worse, but it makes it different. Uh, I, I'll just give you an example. When I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I graduated from high school, and I know we're jumping to high school now, but when I graduated from high school, I enlisted in the Army uh, because, I mean, we could get into that later on too. I, it was the Cold War, and I wanted to kill Russians. Literally, I was in West Germany. The Russians were right across the border, and people don't understand. When I talk about the military life, we literally knew that the Russians would, if they crossed the border, one, where I lived in Marnheim, we were right next to a North Point nuclear storage facility. So we were going to be nuked on day one. So we knew as kids growing up that if the balloon went up, we were all going to die because a nuclear weapon would hit that facility and that was it. But even if we didn't die, let's say we were at school when the war started, the Russians were six days away from it dancing through us. Our, and when I say that our neighborhood was going to be a combat zone, it wasn't theoretical. Every year, the United States military, together with NATO, ran what's called a reforger exercise, return of forces to Germany exercises, where tens of thousands of troops were flown in from the United States to marry up with pre-positioned pre equipment, and then immediately transition into combat. So I'd come home from school on a school bus, and there's an armored division going through our farmer's field. Our village now has become a war zone as guys are running around. Airplanes are flying over, helicopters popping up. Why? Because that was the war. That was where the battle was going to be fought, right in our backyard. And so this was my life as a kid growing up going, and you know, you, you can only see this so much, and you can react one of two ways. A lot of the kids basically said, the hell with the military. I don't want to have anything to do with this. This is sick. I don't like it. And they ran away from it as fast as possible. But that impacts you as well when we talk about the impact. Even the fact that you ran away from it means that the military impacted you as a kid. But for me, I loved it. I looked at it and I went, this is what I want to do. This is the life I want to lead. I want to be one of these guys out there. And I want to be right here right now. So when they come across the border, I get to kill them um, to protect this, protect what I love, protect my family, my community, my neighbors. And that's just everything I wanted to do was, was, uh, was, was geared, you know, towards that. Um, you know, and then I, you know, I ended up going in the, in the, you know, the army and I didn't get along very well <laughs> when I went in the army. Uh, uh, it was the 1970s and uh, the post-Vietnam era. And that's another thing that people have to understand. I wasn't just a military brat. I was a military brat during the Vietnam War and the post-Vietnam era. And the, that, that whole thing that went on where the military was rejected by society. When I was a kid in Hawaii, um, we, we, lived on, uh, we lived on the economy initially uh, over on Kailua side near Kaneohe Marine Corps Air Station. But my dad was Air Force, so he was in Hickam. So he would have to drive to work. And, and we would get our dental service, our medical service, or we'd go to the commissary on Kaneohe huge anti-war demonstrations near the end in 70, 71, 72. So you have to drive through it with people screaming things, with signs, throwing things, spitting, the whole thing. And you're just sitting there as a kid in the car going, wait a minute, <laughs> we're Americans. They're Americans. Why don't they like us? What's going on here? Um, and, and so that, you know, that was a, an impact. And then, like I said, uh, 
again, in Hawaii, two very interesting things happened that were military related. Um, one was we, um, uh, I, I wore a POW bracelet, um, you know, and everybody did in the, at that time, if you were military associated. And uh, we were at Hickam Air Force Base when the POWs came back. And uh, my mom would wake me up every morning uh, when a plane was coming in and she would take me to the uh, terminal and we'd wait for the POWs to come off the airplane. Then we'd, and all the military families were there, all of them. And so when these guys came off the plane, they saw a wall of people cheering them and thanking them. But I had the opportunity to meet my prisoner of war. And uh, they, because they knew, they asked, who has bracelets? And I said, okay. And they went through, okay, your guy's here. Do you want to meet him? I'm like, yeah. And I had an opportunity to meet this guy, give him my bracelet. And, uh, you know, for, I think I was at that time, 10 years old, 11 years old, a hugely uh, it, it's just an impactful thing to, to see that the patriotism, the love, and compare and contrast that because you talked about the them versus us. The care, compare and contrast the love that was there amongst the families for this returning prisoner of war with the people outside the uh, base spitting and yelling and screaming at us. You know, it, it, was, it was traumatic for a child. And the other thing was in 1975, um, we had the opportunity to host a Vietnamese refugee family after the fall of Saigon. Uh, Saigon fell in April, and by May, we had a family living with us who were getting ready to transition to, now this wasn't done through the military, it was done through the church, my mom's church. Yeah, 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 that, that was, that, that was uh, interesting you mentioned that because, and I think either you mentioned it in another show, but I knew about it because I studied liberation theology at, at Norwich and also at seminary, but like uh, churches were caught up with uh, Vietnam uh, refugees, as well as Central American uh, uh, asylum folks, you know, I think you, you mentioned something. They were very active, you know. Very active. Parts. Yeah. yeah. So, so can you share some of that? That's really interesting, you know, because that's part of that whole civilian veteran, military civilian uh, relationship that isn't all that present these days. You know, you don't see the church all that active in these type of things anymore as much no it was it was it was fascinating you know it came um if people study that that era um you know we um we evacuated saigon um and i mean trust me I, again when i say that this consumed my life um you know my father deployed i remember in in the 60s when my father deployed to vietnam the first time and um you know he came back and, you know, he, he brought back, you know, he, again, he, he was in the Air Force. He was an aircraft maintenance officer, wasn't a pilot, wasn't, but, you know, he got shelled and all that stuff, but, you know, he's not a frontline combatant, but still, uh, his best friends died. He had pilots who uh, didn't come back. So, and, and other people got blown up by the mortar attacks. So, you know, he came back a sort of a sullen man. Um, you know, it's hard to remember because I was young at the time. I think I was uh, six years old. Um, but I just remember the father that left, who was uh, sort of a very happy-go-lucky uh, kind of guy. Um, you know, birthdays were really special and all this stuff. And the father that came back was a very serious uh, guy who got angry at us when we wouldn't finish our meals. We got angry at us when we threw temper tantrums for the littlest things, uh, as if, you know, he, we didn't respect what we had as American kids. Um, you know, so, you know, he, he, he'd he give me, you know, the the... the Things like uh, unexploded um, 20 millimeter cannon shells. How many kids get an unexploded 20 millimeter cannon shell from their father? I had it from my prized possession. Uh, he brought back, you know, other things from the from the war. But that that was the word to me. And I'd watch it. Then my uncle got deployed, and he he was sent to, you know, he participated in the invasion of Cambodia, and that of course had all of us worried about that at the time. I remember putting together Christmas packages to send to him. And again, everybody was going to Vietnam or coming back from Vietnam. Uh, and then there was this uh, incident called uh, Koteng Island, the Mayaguez incident, uh, when the uh, US <laughs> Mayaguez was taken over by the Khmer Rouge and the crew was actually taken to the mainland. But we thought because the ship was parked off of Koteng Island that they were on Koteng Island. So we sent the Marines in uh, and it was just a, a, a bad, bad deal. Um, they got, you know, helicopters got shot down, Marines got separated, a lot of Marines died. Um, we ended up pulling away under fire. We abandoned three Marines who ended up getting captured and executed by the Khmer Rouge and Inferior Marine. Oh, we don't do that. We we just, but we did it. 
And uh, it's a, it was a painful thing. But so I'm watching and my dad played a peripheral role. I mean, I don't want to get into too much, but he's the guy that identified the, the last available helicopter and got it fixed so that it could come in and rescue the Marines. Had he not found that helicopter, we might have lost more Marines. So that was sort of a big deal. And I'm following this battle. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this, and I'm I'm of the age there where I'm uh, building dioramas. So I'm, I'm getting these uh, H2O figures and I'm painting them and I'm building a diorama of Potang Island and I'm building a diorama of the North Vietnamese tanks coming into the U.S. Embassy. Oh, uh, is that kind of weird child? And uh, then the, all of a sudden this Vietnamese family shows up and they have got, they got two boys. One's younger than me, one's older than me. And of course we're getting out. And so I'm sitting there excitingly showing them my dioramas and they're very realistic with the North Vietnamese tank coming into the thing with the troops and all that, the South Vietnamese troops surrounding, and I'm showing it to them. And, I, and they're looking at me like, dude, why do you want to show us this? Uh, and, 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 I, and I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I'm like, look how cool this is. Let's play soldier. Let's go out. And they're like, we don't want to play soldier. We just left, you know, the fall of South Vietnam. You know, we went through a really, really bad experience, but they can't speak English and I don't speak their language. And it, eventually it just dawned on me. I'm sitting there one day after they went to bed and I'm looking at the diorama. And I'm going out. And I'm watching the uh, the mother and the father. The, the father was a doctor. He was a very famous doctor. They're both from North Vietnam, actually. They actually went to the South when the when the country divided. But the mother uh, spoke English, uh, but she worked for Air America. Oh. Air America was the CIA proprietary. So she was on a death list. And um, so they got they barely got out. If she if she had stayed, she would have been killed. Husband would have been killed. The kids would have been reeducated. They got out, but I'm watching her watch TV, and, and this is still the drama's unfolding, the fall of Phnom Penh, all that stuff. And so I came out of the room. The two kids went to bed. I came out of the room and in the living room. She's there, and they're watching TV by themselves. My parents are getting surprised, and they're just crying. And I look at the screen, and it's replaying the fall of Saigon and all that stuff. Bam, lights went off, and I went, holy cow. I'm traumatizing these guys. So I went in and I, I didn't destroy the, the dioramas. I put a lot of work into them, but I got rid of them. I put them under the bed and I never again showed that to them. And from that point on, our, our relationship improved a lot. You know, this was done through the church, but that was my mom's business. Um, I mean, you know, like any kid, you, your mom takes you to church and you, you go out before church and you play games. And in the middle of church, while they're giving the sermon, you're making paper airplanes and throwing them. Um, so I wasn't really religious. Um, but I just do remember on things like this, the church community, came together as a community. And one of the things the community wanted to do was uh, was to support the uh, the refugees. But we were one of the only families to actually get a uh, refugee family. Do you think that type of relationship, um, well, one, I want to validate you on that whole situation with the Vietnamese kids, because my dad, you know, I, my, my dad's Korean. He was rock infantry. Uh, and then my mom's from the Dominican Republic, but she died young. Uh, she actually experienced warfare through the 1965, you know, yeah. invasion, you know, uh, into Dominican Republic um, by the U.S. But the thing is, is that my dad, after my mom died, married a Vietnamese woman. And, you know, this was, you know, in the 80s or something like that. Not, no, this was in the 90s. And I'm, I'm playing, you know, Platoon and, and all these movies when I'd come and visit. And, uh, you know, my dad said, don't, don't play that shit. Don't, don't, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, I was, I was like, what, the, what the hell? You know what I mean? I'm just, you know, it's like, don't, don't, don't play that Rose is, you know, you know, just don't. And I, then I got it years later, I got it. And, and yeah. kind of your transformative moment, you got it with these, with these kids. Do you think that, and, and I, I want to get more into this in the future, but do you think that helped you understand? Because I hear you in all your interviews and everything. You try to put yourself into this intercultural dynamic where, you know, you preserve who you are, but at the same time, you try to look at what other people are trying to experience from their reality. Do you think that followed you throughout, even in Iraq, you know, with all these bad guys like Saddam and Tarek Aziz and all these people and then the Soviets and everything. Do you think that, do you think you, you, you were able to kind of like kind of under, try to understand them from where they were coming from? 
Yeah, I mean, but it was more than just that. I mean, if if you'll allow me a second, because um, this is sort of one of the 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 if, if people say you, who are you and how did you become who you are? Okay. Um, you know, I said I was a military brat, and so early on we were, um, you know, we we moved from one base to another base to another base, and so everybody I hung out with as a kid growing up looked like me, primarily white, uh, same um, economic class, you know young broke officers anybody who understands what the pay scale was in the 60s though that it was not a lot of money and so we are eating tuna fish on rice and if i say that my mom's listening i apologize but we ate a lot of tuna fish on rice because rice was cheap tuna fish was cheap and a can of mushroom soup was cheap and you mix it up and i loved it you could throw a little bit of toast on there and some bread and you could feed a family of four uh, or four kids uh you know family of six actually so, you know, we grew up, and, you know, we, we weren't spoiled, we, uh, but we weren't hungry. We, we were just living amongst ourselves comfortable. When we moved to Hawaii, we lived as, on the economy. People need to understand that Hawaii is sort of a unique state where white people are the minority. Not only that, they don't like white people. There's a lot of resentment to white people. So you're a third grade kid going to school. My first day of school, I show up, teacher stands up, I stand up, introduce yourself, because being in the military, we never moved in the summer. We always moved middle of the damn school year. So it means school's already started, the friendships and the cliques have already started, you're coming in the middle of it. Now, normally, if you do that in a military school, everybody's used to that. So they all are like, hey, come on in, we're going to, but when you do that in a civilian school, where it's, you know, it's all people have grown up with each other, you're the outsider coming in. You don't have a support group. And so I come out and uh, I'm like, how you doing? You know, and these guys come up to me and they don't look like me. They're, you know, Filipino, they're Hawaiian, they're Samoan, they're mixed, Japanese, Chinese, not a single white person. And they go, uh, hey, uh, why don't you come down to the, why don't you come down to the playground, recess, get to meet the bee. And I say, okay, I'll come down. They speak pidgin English. I come down there and there's about 20 of them. They beat the living shit out of me. I come down there and they just all just pile on and beat me up. Hey, Howley. But Howley means white boy. You know, don't come back. Go home. Don't come back. If you come back, we beat you up. Well, I missed my school bus, by the way, because they beat me up before I could get to school. So I had to walk home all bloody. My mom's like, what happened? I said, oh, we're just playing rough. But next day, <laughs> when I went to school, they said, hey, you better, yeah, come down to recess. I said, okay. On the way down to recess, the first one came up to me. And I hit him in the face as hard as I could. They proceeded to beat the living dog shit out of me. Uh, but every day, as I walked throughout the school, wherever I walked, one of them came in front of me, I just hit him immediately. I tackle him. It was combat the whole time. This mindset of fighting, fighting, fighting. Um, and my mom was keep getting called to the school. And she's like, why is he always bleeding? And why are his clothes torn up? Uh, rough housing, playing rough. No, mom, I was getting a snot shit kicked out of me, but uh, I was given as good as I take. And the reason why I'm telling this story is eventually we had to learn to deal with each other. Eventually, if we got tired of just this constant fighting. So slowly but surely, um, you know, one day came down and I started hitting, no, 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 no. You okay? Stay here. You know, they wouldn't talk to me first, but then they invite me in. They want to play, hey, you want, you want to play some football, want to play, and you're playing. Then I get invited to their home after school, and you come into their house, and immediately you go, this is different. This is what poverty looks like. This is, this is different. And then you, you, you meet, and you start to pick up the resentment. You know, the, the, the mother is working on the base in Kaneohe, but they treat her like crap because she's a local. And the military people, they always talk about how the military people treat the locals and the disrespect that's shown. I'm sitting there going, but my dad's military. We never treated people with disrespect, or did we? There's the big question. Or did we, and we didn't know it? You know, us leading our lives as normal, are we somehow doing things, and you're just forced to sit there? And again, this is happening as a kid. Right. I'm having right. to come to Jesus moments where I'm just like, holy cow, there's a different world out here full of people. And I think that's what started me, um, beginning to walk so, in people's footsteps. When you were a weapons uh, inspector, the top weapons ex inspector for the UN, and you're in Iraq, and you know Saddam 
you know, bad or good or whatever. You just know that, you know, he's been around, you know, and his people have been around and, uh, you know, they, they know how to dance, you know, uh, in regards to, you know, playing games and everything, you know, in, in regards to playing games and the, the diplomacy game and all that. But what, like, what kind of got you to kind of be able to leverage some type of dialogue? I think this is like important to ask because you gave the background that's important to recognize as far as maybe what you brought into like the spirit of it all. But can you say more, especially like in Iraq, right? I mean, this is, this is post, you know, what, like in, invasion and everything. You were part of that invasion, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you were ahead. I mean, you knew Schwarzkopf and you probably knew that Norwich general who was uh, Colin Powell's, uh, uh, whatever, chief of staff, uh, Gordon Sullivan. Did you ever meet him? No. No. Okay. But you were, but you were, you knew Schwarzkopf and all that. And you like worked Schwarzkopf, with Schwarzkopf fired me twice and arrested me once. So yeah, I know Schwarzkopf. <laughs> Oh gosh, uh, we got to uh, that. Yeah, but, we'll get that. But, no, but, yeah. but before Iraq, um, but again, I mean, it's it's just an overall thing. From Hawaii, and I mean, it, you know, again, just a real brief thing. Um, we lived in Kailua, but then my dad moved. That's moved, we moved to Hickam Air Force Base, so we got picked up out of. I just won over the locals. I'm now one of them. I'm invited in their homes and all that kind of stuff. And then we move back uh, onto Hickam, we're on the base, where I'm surrounded by military people again. And now, uh, on sixth grade, we had an on-base school. Seventh grade was an Aliamanu Intermediate School, which is a local school. Now, a lot of military kids go there, so I had some people who looked like me and had the background. But bottom line is, we're entering contested space. Um, you know, and it was a war from day one, but it's a different enemy now. It's not the same enemy I just... Uh, one over, but they don't care that I was friends with, uh, you know, this guy over there. They're going to beat the crap out of me now. I went out for the football team on seventh, in seventh grade. They met me and they beat me up, almost crippled me. Uh, I couldn't make the, the tryouts. Eighth grade, I came back and they said, no, no, no. I said, yes, yes, yes. They beat the living crap out of me again. Couldn't make the tryouts. Ninth grade, I'm coming out and I, again, I'm dropping my bag. I'm starting running out. No, 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 no. You're okay. Come on. You know, and, and I finally, it took me two Two and a half years, but I won me over going out for the team. We get the orders and we move to Turkey. And so I just won myself in and we moved to Turkey. Um, but Turkey, we lived on the economy. And um, I made a concerted effort. Maybe I, I don't know why it is, because not everybody did this. A lot of American military person, uh, brats, uh, we call ourselves military brats, um, become very insular, especially if they have a base. And so even though we all had to live on the economy, we had buses that could take us to Balgad Air Station where the school was. There was a youth center and all this. So a lot of kids would just stay at Balgat and then come home, go to school, stay at Balgat. I wanted to come home and just go out into Turkey because it was the wild, wild west, baby. It was awesome. Um, I mean, to be a, a kid, I, I think when we first moved there, I was 14 years old. And um, there was, I mean, it, it's sad because Turkey was going through a lot of unrest. But so there were riots with soldiers in the streets. They had an attempted coup, so there were tanks on the corner. But for me, I'm sitting there going, dude with guns in the street. This is awesome. Tanks on the street. This is awesome. This is like, you know, Hollywood playground. This stuff. And, it, you know, it, it, Turkey was like that. We had terrorists who would chase our school bus and fire pistols at it. And, uh, I mean, it was a really stressful life for my parents. But for the kids, we're just like, God, this is awesome. Um, but I learned Turkish and I thoroughly integrated myself with Turkish society uh, as much as 14, 15, 16 year old kid can. Sure. But um, sure. you know, I, 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 I kept a, a very, very open mind. And then you transition to that into, um, you know, because before Iraq was Russia. And remember, I, I joined the military to do one thing and one thing only, and that's to kill Russians. And I'm serious about that. I was as fanatic as you could possibly get. If you go back and look at my 1979 high school yearbook, even the guys who were J JROTC, and I wasn't, uh, they're just like, you're a true believer. You know, this one guy I know is going to be able to go up there and kill Russians. It's going to be you. 
kind of thing, because I was literally just that focused. How do they give me orders to the Soviet Union? Oh, and I had studied, oh, yeah, I, I had studied Russia in college. I studied the language, the culture, the history. I absorbed it as much as I could. I knew it inside and out as much as you can, remote control. But now the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty is signed, and I'm sent to the Soviet Union to implement this treaty. I'm actually the first inspector on the ground in the Soviet in, in, Union. In the Soviet Union. So this yeah. was not Russia. Not, not, oh, no, was... this is the Soviet Union. So what year, what year roughly was this? I, I, I the first, My first travels were June 1988. So uh, were there. Okay. And I have to tell you, landing in Moscow uh -huh. after studying it your whole life, or your whole adult life, landing in Moscow, going through the KGB um, border control point, and entering Soviet society and breathing Soviet air. Because everything I'm doing, I'm just going, this is Soviet, Soviet step. And then suddenly seeing things, driving through the, the, the suburb of Kimki, but going in your mind, this is the furthest advance of the of, of the Nazi forces in uh, in December of 1941. This is it. This is where the Nazi troops were. Um, you know, and, and then as you go on, you see the Kremlin, you walk through Red Square, you see Lenin's tomb. Uh, you're seeing all this stuff, and you're just like, "This is real. This is this is no longer theoretical. This is real. This is the capital of the enemy," and and you're just thinking that the whole time. And then they send me to Vodkins, which is 750 miles east of there. Uh, it's a it's a it's a town that has a factory that produces intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. And so my job is to help build an inspection monitoring facility outside the gates of this factory and monitor missile production. And the guys that I'm working with on the Soviet side are the guys who used to build those missiles. So their whole approach to life was building missiles to kill Americans. I'm coming in having spent two and a half years with the Marine Corps fine tuning the art of killing them. Now we have to work together in cooperative fashion to, to create this thing. And we were, everybody was polite uh, at first. I mean, there was no, you know, staring at each other. Although when we did the initial interview with the local editor of the local newspaper, Afterwards, she's like, you know, we were raised to believe that you had horns and tails, you know, that you were the devils. Um, she said, but you guys clearly don't have horns, you don't have tails, and you seem like you seem like nice people, like just like us. And that was interesting because they had prejudice, we had prejudices, they had prejudices. So while we're working together, we're sort of dancing around each other, you know, this this eyeball on each other. Uh, we'd have uh, events where we'd get together. Um, we socialized with, so we lived in the middle of the city. So when we came out of, you know, we woke up in the morning, we could go for a walk in the town and they sort of started waving to us and we'd start waving to them. Then we could go in and we'd start having conversations and talking, but it wasn't until New Year's. And I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again, just because it is a, it's, it's, it's one of those transformative moments. Uh, on New Year's Eve, 1988, uh, myself and three inspectors were invited to the home of one of these Soviet engineers. Igor Yefremov, and um, he was a shift leader, so we knew him, um, we'd worked with them, but now we get to go up to his house, and he opens the door, and there's his family, and it just sort of was one of those moments where it's like, boom, he has a family, of course he has a family, but we never considered that, because he's a Soviet, and Soviets are soulless creatures who have no emotions, who are, you know, they're communists, how can they possibly have a family, communists can't have families, communist babies are made by, you know, some official pushing a button and a baby comes out, no, clearly a man and a woman do not make love and produce a baby, not in a society, but there's his wife and she's as normal as any wife has ever been, welcoming us into their home and it's an intimate environment. Um, they bring in their neighbors and you see how the kids play with each other and you're just sitting there going, this is just like us. These guys are just like us. They they laugh at the same bad jokes. They, uh, they cry at, at, at things. They love each other. They want a better future. And it was just one of those moments where I went, why did I want to kill these people? Because there's a difference. You really, that's where I learned there's a difference between legitimate self-defense, which, you know, sometimes you have to do it. I, a lot of people get mad at me when I talk about, you know, the Atticus Finch moment where I say, you know, I, I love dogs, but if there's a rabid dog, I want Atticus Finch to come in and shoot it. Um, and the military's job is to be Atticus Finch because there are rabid dogs in the world and sometimes they need to be shot. Um, but there's a difference between that and driving around town in your SUV shooting every stray dog you see. 
Um, I was the drive around town in the SUV shooting every stray dog kind of person till that moment because I realized that war is not the answer here. These guys aren't the enemy, that the solution to the Soviet problem is just what we're doing right now, meeting people, talking to people, listening to people. And it was a skill set that I had learned in Hawaii. Uh, I had learned in Turkey. I had learned with the Vietnamese refugees, but now I'm practicing it for real. And so that was the, the big moment. I mean, and, and the, what I learned in the Soviet Union impacts what I'm doing today, trying to have outreach with the uh, uh, Russians, et cetera. But that skill set also transferred over to Iraq, but in a different way. Because well, before we go Soviet, into that, but, well, before we go into that, I want people to understand that you were, uh, as a result of that time in the Soviet Union, you were, uh, and and you know the details. I mean, at Norwich, I don't know, in some Cold War studies class, I forgot all the different agreements, but you know all of it. You were involved in something that was really important that yeah. limited uh you know limited new you know nuclear you know uh arms building and and all this tension and everything like that so and you did it not as a peace freak you know you did it as you know in, in a diplomatic kind of you know dialogical way can you can you say something about yeah, that yeah I- Look, the, the treaty was the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. And um, what made it unique is it's the first time we didn't limit the size of an arc. We reduced, we eliminated, we got rid of an entire category of nuclear weapons. It was the beginning of disarmament, not arms control, but disarmament. And these were weapons that were literally on the verge of destroying the world. Had we not done this treaty, and I'm not being facetious here, I always tell people, you know, when they meet me, I said, you want to shake my hand and buy me a beer? Because if it weren't for me and my fellow inspectors, you'd be dead. And they're sort of like, ha ha. And I'm like, no, I mean it. And I do mean it. If we didn't have this treaty, we'd probably all be dead because there would have been a nuclear war. So this was a very, very big deal, getting rid of these weapons. And But the, the thing that made this treaty work was the verification regime. Um, Prior to this, you know, we had satellites, we had agreements and all that stuff. But the one thing that both sides agreed on is that they would never allow personnel from the other side on their soil because we just didn't trust them. You're not going to get to come and inspect my facilities. and I'm not going to come and inspect yours because I don't trust you. You don't trust me. This ain't never going to happen. But what made the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty work was on-site inspection, where we would take trained personnel who would travel over to the other side and do the verification inspections on the ground in a relatively intrusive fashion. Uh, and they would do it to us, it was all reciprocal. Um, but that exchange of people now uh, broke down walls of distrust and fear, et cetera. So that whole process of the of implementing the in- Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, when people say, well, how did you become an onsite, you know, like chief, chief weapons inspector in Iraq? I say, well, one of the reasons is I wrote the book on onsite inspection, literally. I wrote the book, so did other people. But prior to us doing what we did, nobody had ever done it before, literally. I, I, I also facetiously tell people, you know, they say, well, how'd you become an expert? I said, well, there's a couple ways you can become an expert. One, you can study it and and, and become a, an honest to God, real expert, or just be the first person to ever do it. <laughs> because after you finish it, you're the expert because no one else has done it. And so when we implemented on-site inspections in the INF treaty, there was only a couple hundred of us. And we became this very unique body of people who did impl- on-site inspection implementation of you know, treaty and the compliance, ver- the verification compliance associated with that. So um, there was a very unique skill set that I developed um, there in the uh, in the Soviet Union. Yeah, and and I, I think that's that that's awesome right before because that that ties into the Iraq thing that we'll get into. But before that, you know, I have a lot of, you know, buddies of mine, they like to talk history and, and they don't like to read. They like to do history <laughs> channel stuff and, and play all this, you know, Dungeons and Dragons type of scenario, Cold War scenarios. But I, I want to ask you, because to shut them down, I feel as though I need to ask you, because you know this, um, in regards to World War II, because they're still, you know, Band of Brothers, and they did honorable things, Normandy, all that. Hey, they're awesome, you know, 101st, 82nd, and, and the others. 
um, my, my friend's dad was, was there, you know, very important. I saw his, you know, medals and stuff, important. But I wanted to ask you in regards to if there's a battle to look at as far as to recognize that um, these these Russians aren't like a bunch of Ivan Koloffs from like the WCW Wrestling Federation, that they knew what was going on. If there's a battle from World War II to understand uh, Russian proficiency, that they are something serious, uh, what's, what's a battle to, to look at? Um, from World War II that really looks at, you know, Soviet Soviet power, you know, uh, up close and personal. That kind of really suppressed uh, uh, the, the 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 Nazis and 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 SS forces and all that. So yeah, the, I mean, on, you know, the battle would be the Battle of Kursk, and the reason why is this. Um, you know, people say, well, Stalingrad, or you can go about Battle of Moscow, or you know, you know. You can't talk about developed Soviet military theory early on in the war. Uh, the German blitzkrieg came in and it caught the Soviets on their back feet and they were struggling to recover. I mean, there's a lot of heroism, a lot of maneuvering, but you can't say that's it because it's all reactive, reactive, reactive. Even up to the Battle of Moscow, Moscow was just about pure cojones, um, you know, what the, what the Russians brought to bear. But if you want to learn about grit, Battle of Moscow has, you know, thrown bodies in, in wintertime to keep, do this kind of stuff. Um, you learn a lot about the character of the Soviet fighting man at that point in time, but still it's reactive. It's not really, the Russians didn't have a chance, the Soviets didn't have a chance to develop theory. Then you get 1942, um, you get, you know, the, the offensive in the South, Case Blue, the battle for Crimea, the battle uh, for Stalingrad going in the Caucasus and all that, but it's still the Soviets are reacting. So it'll be a counterattack, but it's a counterattack that's based upon not the strongest stance, because remember, it's defeat, 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 defeat. And it wasn't that the Soviets necessarily got stronger, but the Germans got weaker. And so they attacked. But then 1943, in the, you know, in the spring and leading up to the summer, both sides built up significant military capability. The Germans rebuilt their military, brought in all this offensive uh, power, and they're preparing for offensive operations. And the Soviets built up their reserves. And so this is where you get into Soviet operational art and uh, in, 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 in the discussion. Yeah, because this, this, is, this is, folks, when you talk Scott Ritter right here, this is, this is when you pay attention. So please. Well, it's a set-piece battle. It's a set-piece battle where both sides are ready, okay. where both sides have got their feet firmly planted. They both have paired. There's no, there hasn't been extensive battles of maneuver they're both in entrenched ready to go with forces and now they're going to go up against each other and it's system against system and to you, you read the histories of you know how the soviet command operated during this battle how they the decisions they had to make uh to sacrifice this unit to give up this terrain to hold here to you know buy time for this to happen and then you go back and at the same time because the thing I try to impart on people is that war is a ballet. It's a very delicate ballet. It's not about, you know, a bunch of cavemen coming up and beating each other with sticks. There's a lot of that going on. But it's also a ballet about logistics. It's a ballet about air support. It's a ballet, if they're going to bring in air support, where's our anti-aircraft fire? If we're going to bring in armor, where's our anti-tank armor? And you're positioning forces. How are we going to sustain that? And anticipating movement. And all this. So there's this giant ballet with these conductors back there, you know, conducting the orchestra that's going to help coordinate the movement. And so you're watching a German orchestra go up against the Soviet orchestra, and the Soviets won. And they won because they're pretty damn good at what they do. And what they do is large-scale military operations where they make really, really difficult decisions. Uh, and, and some of these decisions result in the deaths of people. But the other thing is, when you understand what they're doing, they're not heartless. There's this concept that the Soviets just, just willy-nilly threw people away. They didn't. They were in the most difficult situation possible, a literal fight for the survival of their nation. And so sometimes hard decisions had to be made about, you know, this unit can't retreat. Uh, but I'll tell you what, the guys in that unit knew they couldn't retreat, and they died. 
they made a decision to die. They didn't want to die, but they died. They died like men. Uh, you know, that's, I mean, as somebody who's, you know, been to war and fortunately never got confronted with that situation, but I'm always like, I don't want to die. I really don't want to die. I mean, I keep saying, I, that's something I would die for. Would I? I don't know because I was never tested that way. I mean, in a real situation, I'm not talking about, you know, normal combat where we have accrued a lot of advantages and this is a potential of dying. I'm talking about entering a battle with a 100% certainty of death. You are not coming out of this. How are you going to act? Are you going to fold up and cry and whimper? Or are you going to go forward and do your job knowing there's no hope? Knowing there's no hope, you are going to die. That's what the Russians did. And if you're not saluting that, you're doing it wrong. That doesn't mean that you have to say they're better than us. I'm just saying respect it. Respect that. And if you study the Battle of Kursk, it is full of that. And then every battle afterwards was about the Russians imposing their will on the Germans. Um, the Germans fought back. There was a lot of, you know, it, it was very bloody after that. But just like I said, you couldn't really judge uh, Soviet military art leading up to Kursk because they were on their back foot constantly. They had a lot of disadvantages. You can't really judge German operational art uh, beyond that because they were on their back foot. The Soviets had the advantages. But where they were relatively equal, the one battle where it was equal on each side was Kursk. And uh, the Soviets won that battle, and they won it because they're the better uh, conductors. They had the better orchestra. Their dancers were better. Wow, I, I really appreciate that. Gosh, uh, you know, I get mesmerized when I get these lectures from you. I'm not paying you tuition money, okay? Because Columbia's got too much <laughs> bill money. But you should set up a, a a a school, not like Trump, for profit. Like do 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 the, do the military school of of, of uh, the Ritter School of uh, Military Theory. Gosh, yeah, that. Gosh, I'm gonna check that out, and I'm gonna tell all my boys that uh, they need to look at that. And then I wanted to ask you these things because, uh, you know, before we get into uh, Iraq, because you just, uh, you know, you, you lived it and, and all, and you understand it. What do you think about the, um, you know, M Mearsheimer said something about, you know, for example, we get into we get into war with like China and, uh, you know, can we actually, you know, accept, you know, having a strike, you know, hit like a aircraft carrier with 5,000 people just dying, you know, I mean, are the Chinese that, um, how could I say it? I mean, I, I was in a course once and I said, you know, well, when the, when the Chinese developed their middle class, professor told me, cor corrected me, you don't understand. Their middle class is larger than our middle class. And you know what he said? Yeah. yeah. And then you know what he said? He said, I'm not going to have you look at the library for, for, for stats on that. I want you to look around. And I saw all the students. They're paying cash. They're not on student loans. They're body figures. That They're not like what you grew, what we grew up on, you know, knowing the image of, you know, Chinese students you know getting the charity from church you know set you know help a help a chinese student or help indians you know that these kids that are you know are are almost like my size they're well nourished they're wearing western clothes they are in it and they're proficient in their studies so they are formidable in regards to an active nation a thriving nation and um to just think that we're just going to go to war and just go 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 march through Beijing and Shanghai like the Japanese did, you know, uh, you know, in '38 or whatever, you know, uh, that's 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 not a reality that that that's going to happen. No. Uh, first of all, let's I'll make another observation. I'll bet you a dime to a dollar that uh, each one of those Chinese kids knows America inside and out, and yet all the American counterparts don't know anything about China. And that's a huge advantage because not only are they nurse like us and dress like us and all that kind of stuff, they know us and we don't know them. And if you go back to Sun Tzu, know your enemy as thyself. Um, if we don't know the enemy, like we're going to make a lot of mistakes. 
but we don't need to go to war with China. I mean, that's, I, I just start off by saying that we shouldn't want to go to war with China. There's no necessity to go to war with China. But the other thing I'll point out is we've become, there was a time when America knew how to take a punch. You know, um, you know, we had Pearl Harbor, lost a lot of guys. We had the Battle of Tarawa, lost a lot of guys. Guadalcanal, lost a lot of guys. Iwo Jima, lost a lot of guys. Okinawa, lost a lot of guys. Um, we can go through all the European battlefields. We lost a lot of guys. Um, you know, because that's what war does. War chews people up. It consumes them. It's bloody. Um, on a scale, a scope and scale that, you know, is just unimaginable. But then, you know, our, our society, uh, you know, and I have to tell you, when I trained to go to war against the Soviet Union, when I was with the Marines in 29 Palms, California, mm -hmm. um, you know, we were at that time perfecting what we called maneuver warfare because we were trying to prevent a situation where we unnecessarily expended lives for an operational um, objective that could have been achieved through maneuver. Uh, we don't need to build monuments to dead Marines. We should be seeking to maneuver, uh, to exploit maneuver and firepower to create a situation where we achieve the military objective without frontal assault. Um, we, 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 we train like that, but we're also cognizant of the fact that um, we're going up against an enemy that could hit hard. Uh, we train for a chemical biological warfare environment. And, um, I, and I'll also remember, because there's a lot of people saying, you know, ah, we would have won that. I said, really? Have you ever, when was the last time you did a three-day war in full NBC kit? Oh, yeah. Um, and I know when we tried to do it, when, you know, everybody's, guess, 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 and yeah. you're putting on stuff, and you're all going, and we're we're doing it, and uh, this is in the desert uh, in, in 29 Palms, and uh, basically about a day and a half into the three-day thing, they had to shut down the exercise guys because everybody had heat uh, heat exhaustion. Some people had heat stroke. Uh, guys were just dropping in the suits because it's impossible to fight in that. Now, people say, well, we did it during Desert Storm. No, we didn't. And we didn't do it during the uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom either. We wore suits, but we had them ventilated. We weren't wearing the gas masks. And it's it, it, it did, you know, anybody will tell you that wearing that stuff, when we crossed the red line going towards Baghdad, uh, I wasn't there, but the people that did, and they got to take off the, the chemical suits, the, the the freedom of operation that happens now that you can move uh, and not be encumbered by this was tremendous. But we trained for that kind of war back then. And um, when we when we first went over to uh, Iraq in, in 90, 1990, 1991, we brought uh, 10,000 body bags wow. because we fully expected that the, uh, you know, breaching the Iraqi lines was going to be a bloody, bloody affair, that we were going to lose a lot of people doing that. And Suddenly the war ends and we didn't lose a lot of people. We we had minimal casualties compared to the Iraqis. And I think at that point in time, the American people became accustomed to war being easy. War is easy. You know, we send the American forces over. And yes, Dover Air Base receives a 10 ca caskets here and seven caskets there. But we never had 10,000 caskets come home. Um, this, this generation doesn't know that. Right. For us, right. war is always on the cheap. We lose one soldier, two soldiers, 16 soldiers, 30 soldiers, sailors, airmen, but we've never had to deal with a single day casualty figure of seven, 10, 15,000, um, not part of our, our psyche. And I'm here to tell people right now that if we ever fight the Chinese or the Russians, you better get used to losing 15,000 guys a day. And, and it's not something out of like, a, and, and God rest his soul, you know, you know, for whatever flaws he had, you know, he, he's still a hero, uh, Dick, Dick Marsanko. And we all know that to a certain extent he had to, because of legal fees, do the books, you know, and the way he did it. But uh, these wars that you're talking about, these hardcore uh, conventional wars and even, you know, wars that, that involve all combat arms, you know, and, and as you, you You've I've heard you talk about you know so brilliantly about you know artillery and all that and armor and and, and just the coordination of all that. This isn't like sending some type of uh, you know uh, SEAL team or Green Beret team in and uh, the war's over after you know uh, whatever the, the 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 head leaders killed Putin's killed because we were able to sneak someone in. that that ain't that type of war right I mean no. 
Yeah. I mean, and, and I'm not denigrating no. these people. Look, during during oh, the no. Gulf War, I I, I served alongside uh, yeah. uh, both the British SAS mm -hmm. and um, Delta Force, uh, doing counter scud operations in Western Iraq. Oh. And um, the the heroism of these guys is unmatched. Their physical condition is unmatched. Their military professionalism is unmatched. But they didn't fight a real war. They fought uh, a war in the shadows. They fought, you know, a, a covert war. There were uh, very few actual stand-up gunfights um, in, in, in that fight. Uh, and the number of people that died in an in exchange of uh, fire was very small. Um, so, you know, that, the, you know war that you, the reality of war that you're talking about, and, and I've heard you in the past say it, and, and I think my audience would be interested. We're talking about, you know, entering into in, 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 into a battle zone and within four minutes, you know, uh, half your platoons out, you know, because of half your platoon, if you're lucky, we, we did a, we did a training exercise, 29 Palms, where we, your know, first Marine division had just perfected its maneuver warfare. And we're going to, we're going to do it. We're going to do it force on force against the seventh light infantry division out of Fort Ord, uh, yeah. California. Yeah. And the seventh light infantry division is going to come down and we were going to do using miles equipment and all this stuff. We're going to do a force on force, uh, fight. And, you know, the Marines being the Marines, of course, we're just the best in the world. There's nobody better than us. And then we put on our dress blues and we really know it because we just pray and go, aren't we pretty? We are Marines. We are the best. <laughs> and then we got in there and we executed the attack as we always execute the attack um, in 29 Palms in the area where we call combined arms exercise. And we're going to go up to the T and turn right or left. And we always win because we're Marines. We can't lose. Nobody can beat us. Meanwhile, the Army now is out there. And just with their initial screening force, as we moved across, we lost 100% of our tanks and 100% of our Amtraks within the first hour. They had to stop the exercise and pull everybody back and say, what the hell just happened? We just lost everything. Why? Because the 7th Light Infantry Division was had perfected the, the, the art of you know tank killer teams. And they were out there and they dispersed their forces and they set up ambushes. And we came in and they killed us all. And so we had to pull back, and then we, we started the fight again. They had to stop it again and pull back. And so now the Marines, we're not stupid. Uh, we're a little foolhardy, but we're looking at it going, we got We can't do what we've been trained to do. Uh, apparently, everything we've been doing is wrong. So we had to relearn how to fight. And so we had to go out and bring out scouting teams uh, that would make contact with the enemy. And then we'd have to bring our forces up and eliminate these things. The, but the point is, took us three days to get to our phase one objective, which was supposed to be a day one objective. And by the time we got to phase one objective, just fighting the screening forces, we haven't even hit their main forces yet. We're down to 50% capacity. And they had to stop the exercise at that point and say, gentlemen, if we ever go to war, we're screwed. We And, and I remember the, the general's debrief. He came up and he said, I'm really glad this happened because this has to be a wake up call to us all that if we were to go and execute one of our operation plans that the Soviets came through Iran and we're going to take Chabahar, Bandar Abbas, and go up and have a meeting and game set with them, all the assumptions we have about what's going to happen there have just been thrown out because we just got our asses handed to us by a force that we all thought we were going to roll through on day one. They beat us in a stand-up fair fight because they're better than we are. And we can't, as Marines, we, we can't allow that. Nobody's allowed to be better than us. And so they took they took a pause and they really and I'll say that uh, unfortunately for me um, after that debrief I got sent to uh, the Soviet Union so I never got to be part of the remaking of the Marines of uh, 29 Palms but I'll tell you what that happened in um, 1987 and by 1990 the Marine Corps that was deployed to uh, to Kuwait was a completely different Marine Corps. Uh, the Marines that, that went up against the Iraqis were a totally different Marine Corps, and they learned by that experience about uh, how, how to fight that kind of war. And the performance of the Marines was superlative. I, I, I always remember Schwarzkopf saying, because um, I, I, again, another little war story, I was picked, I was plucked out of amphibious warfare school um, in Quantico, Virginia, and um, sent to be a, the intelligence officer on what they called the ad hoc uh, planning staff working for the Commandant of the Marine Corps to come up with um, amphibious operation concepts that could be briefed to General Schwarzkopf because Schwarzkopf just wanted to put Marine divisions on the line in Kuwait and go, hey, diddle, diddle straight up the middle to Kuwait City. And 
comment of the Marine Corps, Al Gray, one of the greatest men ever, yeah. said, that's not what we do. We're amphibious. So our job was to come up with some amphibious options. And I actually, as a captain, a junior captain, um, <laughs> while my amphibious warfare school classmates are doing standard um, you know, exercises for captain level, I'm designing a core level amphibious assault against Alfau Peninsula at the, that's being briefed to the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Um, so I was I was taken from I get you're you're in a PhD program, so I was taken from you know uh, undergraduate 101 to defending my thesis you know, overnight, literally briefing this to the Commandant of the Marine Corps at Headquarters Marine Corps um, as a junior captain, and it got briefed to Schwartz Cobb. He said no, but then the thing that I had to do after that was they put me in the War Fighting Center, and uh, they had this big computer called Janus Computer. It's a it's a war gaming computer. And I had to program it with the actual Iraqi defensive lines that the Marines would go across using satellite imagery. And then I took the classified order of battle, put the Iraqis in there, and then you program each unit with certain combat capabilities. Then I built up the Marine forces according to our plan. And then we would run war game simulations where the forces would come in. And then we'd evaluate what happened and reprogram to try and get it as realistic as possible. By the time I finished, the Marines were able to cut through it. So that was brief to General Boomer. Uh, Walt Boomer is the commander of the Marine Forces, and he, you know, thanked me. He's like, we were changing our battle plan because of this. Um, and later on, I got a very nice letter from Major General Caulfield, who uh, commanded this this effort, uh, and he said that um, what I did saved hundreds of Marines' lives, and that's one of the best letters I've ever received in my life. Was, is, was that, uh, yeah, was that, was that when, uh, you know, Persian Gulf War, where, where to, to a certain extent, Saddam was expecting an amphibious assault, and so you you had uh, to you know to a certain extent you were like designing something that it would. Well, he was expecting an assault on the Kuwaiti coast. We were going to come in over the Al Fau Peninsula and then bypass his defenses, swing in and hit Tor Al Zubair, which was their logistical hub. Oh. And by doing that, cut off Kuwait from their supplies and force the Iraqis to pivot their Republican Guard. At the same time, the army was doing their left hook, and now they'd be in a horns of dilemma uh, to either respond to the Marines or respond to the army. But if they move, the air power gets them. It's a big elaborate plan; would have worked, but Schwarzkopf said no. But they 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 redid it. But I remember Boomer briefed Schwarzkopf, and because uh, the whole thing about the Marines is this left hook was going to take place here. The idea is that the Marines would fix the Iraqis here so the left hook could come in and and get them. And and Boomer went. Dude, you don't understand. By the time you're finished developing that, we'll have captured Kuwait City. And, uh, you know, three days. We'll, we'll take Kuwait City in three days. And Schwarzkopf's like, no, you won't. He said, yes, we will. We, we've got the plan. And uh, Schwarzkopf, no. War starts. Marines are advancing. There's this big gap now between the Army and the Marines because their Army's not advancing fast enough. So the Marines had to be slowed down. Schwarzkopf actually had to tell the Marines, stop, we would have taken Kuwait City in two days, but we had to stop it so the Army could catch up with their left hook and move on. But that's what I was trying to tell you. Marine operational art had, uh, had, had you know, transformed itself by orders of magnitude from what we had done in the deserts of 29 Palms 1987 to what we executed on the ground uh, in Kuwait in 1991. And then, and then, and then, that uh, that whole that whole situation, and and I wanted to get a little bit of clarity. But when you did put it in the computer and all that, it did it did it did it did predict that it would be successful. Or well, the first time we did it, the Marines got slaughtered. Okay, slaughtered. I mean, we're just sitting here, we're just getting wiped out, and so we're sitting there going, okay. I, the thing I, I I insisted on was realism. But we looked at the figures, and we realized we gave the Iraqis too much morale. Uh, you know, the, the, their fighting spirit was, and we're like, well, wait a minute. They're going to be in there. We're going to be bombing. Let's lower the morale a little bit. Then we gave them too much connectivity, communications connectivity. So let's disrupt their communications. Uh, we gave them too much artillery uh, coordination. Let's disrupt that, reduce the artillery. Let's, you know, and then and we degraded the Iraqis down to what we thought would be real. Yeah. And with the Marines, you know, we had to reduce some things, but we, we gave the Marines good scores and, and other. And once we adjusted the numbers based upon reality, not we weren't trying to game the system, yeah. we were trying yeah. to make it realistic. Yeah. Once we got it real, 
what the Marines did in the final simulations was exactly what they did uh, on the ground. Exactly. Wow. Wow. That's, that's impressive. Yeah. That's, I, I wanted, I wanted to get the listeners because I was like, Hey, you know, uh, I don't want you to leave the show with uh, anything incomplete undone. You know, it's like, he's got, Scott's got all kinds of books to write, uh, dogs to take care of, interviews to do, so no bother. <laughs> get, let's get him. Let's get him here. Um, yeah. So some other uh, one question before. Uh, so when you were uh, in the role of UN nuclear uh, weapons inspections, how did you make such an impact? Since you know the Iraqis got humiliated uh you know i mean i i remember even though i you know i'm a christian you know i was a former monk i i had a little bit of a and even when i later on went went to iraq i had a a, a very uh close tie to the chaldean uh christians and stuff like that and so i know Tarek aziz was was a christian and all that and i don't know i don't know how you were able to do this but how were you able you know we had humiliated them and how were you able to deal with Tarek Aziz, deal with, you know, the Iraqis and just do what you were able to do and and really get some really solid data while you were in Iraq to, to make your um, to make the deductive point that, uh, that that that's valid? You know, I mean, that proved to be valid. I mean, I, I mean, all that no, it, to a yeah. certain level of, you know ballet to a certain extent as well as you know um working on the hard drive yeah my um uh, you know, my entire life history is just based upon what i call serendipity um because if you if you know not, me not, 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 not the not the not the, not the john kuzak serendipity yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you caught me on that one All right. yeah. no uh it's just luck being in the right place at the right time um just pure luck i mean you know, I mean, there's got to be a modicum of intelligence and skill, but uh, if you know me, I am literally the most normal person you're ever going to meet in your life. Uh, my my wants and desires are as simple as everybody else. I love my dogs. I love my wife. I like playing golf. I used to like drinking beer a lot. I drink beer a lot less now, but you know, I, I, I'm, I am just the average guy on the street, literally. In fact, the average guy on the street is more capable than me because they can actually repair a car, change oil. I have to go to Jiffy Lube. I mean, I, you know, I am literally incompetent as the day is long about some of the basic things in life, but I enjoy oh, life at a very base level. Um, that's, why I, I, got, that's why you have your Caspian Sea caviar, you know, stored <laughs> there and your- Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry yeah, about yeah, that. You yeah, you you my, you, you know, I saw you, you at saw the my Russian refrigerator, tea room. Right? I saw you at the Russian tea room a couple of years ago, you know. Uh, well, did um, I have my pinky up? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't me. Um, <laughs> but you look, you look like you, man. Uh, no, so but, <laughs> but I was just very, I was just very lucky. Um, uh -huh. You know, I, I, I had this experience. You know, I got to do the inspections in the Soviet Union because, for a simple reason, they, they were looking for. Back then, we had what we called a, a Soviet fail, foreign area officer, and they were the experts on the Soviet Union. And you get to be a foreign area officer at the rank of major. Uh, so when you when you achieve the rank of major, if you've been very accomplished in your field, you can apply for the program. And if you pass the batteries of exams, they send you to get your advanced degree, your master's degree um, in, in Russian area studies. And then they send you to Monterey, California for a year of intensive language training. And then you get sent to uh, Garmisch, Germany, what was called the uh, US Army Russian Institute where you have a year or two years of immersion training language-wise and culture-wise. They had a village there populated by Russian emigres. And so you learned to go shopping, speaking Russian. Everything you did was speaking Russian while taking classes on Russian military doctrine, Russian military, da 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 And then depending on your jobs, you're gonna be sent to the embassy. Then you go through a, um, uh, an attache course at the Defense Intelligence College. Um, if you're gonna be sent to, um, military liaison mission in Germany, which is one of the wonderful assignments, the one I always wanted to be the guys on the ground spying on the Soviets, riding around in your souped up Mercedes-Benz G-Wagons, 
taking photographs, getting shot at, you know, all that kind of James Bond stuff. You could go there after you take a special course. But and these guys are doing real world stuff. I mean, my boss, uh, one of my bosses, um, Colonel George Murdoch Connell, United States Marine Corps, a legend. This guy got a silver star in Vietnam leading a bayonet charge to rescue a Marine squad that was uh, that, that had been surrounded. Uh, got wounded in the arm, refused evacuation, got the guys out. He's that kind of guy. Uh, but then he, um, you know, he he's also as a, as a lieutenant colonel in, um, in at the embassy in Moscow. He's the guy that uh, carried out a um, a unique intelligence collection mission uh, in St. Petersburg, Leningrad at the time, to collect intelligence on Soviet submarines that are being produced. And what he did, uh, I write about it in the book I just wrote, but he you know, tied himself into the funnel of a ferry boat overnight after escaping the KGB surveillance. And as the boat went across the construction yard, they had a, a gap to let the sun in, but it blocked the satellites. But he was able to take photographs through that gap that exposed Soviet production techniques that ended up saving the United States billions of dollars in research and development and helped us equalize uh, the, the, the submarine warfare thing. Hero, that kind of thing. The KGB was so mad at them that they beat them up on Red Square. Seriously. Seriously? Yep. They, they, they hired a, a gang of thugs who beat him up while his KGB opposite sat there and watched him. This was the Cold War. This is what I wanted to do. This is this is the real stuff. So these are all the guys doing it. These are the real experts. And then they brought me in. Some idiot in 29 Palms, California, who took Russian history, uh, studied two years of Russian language, but played football while I was doing that, which means that I was drinking beer more than I was memorizing Russian words. My language was so bad that before they sent me over there on the advanced party, they sent me to a two-week special course where they brought in the best Russian linguist, a female, old Russian lady. She was training me for two weeks. On my graduation day, she was in tears, not because I was good, because she had failed her country. I was that bad. She was like, oh, my God, I failed. I can't believe I, I failed my country. I this is the guy they sent over to Russia. Uh, to be the first inspector on the ground. Dumber than dirt, naive, can't speak the language. And yet, because I was the first person to do something, I became the expert. And I'm not going to brag or anything, but by the time I finished, I had two classified commendations from the director of the CIA for the work that I did there. My name was being briefed at the presidential level, secretary of defense level, and all that stuff, because Marines are Marines. And if you give us an opportunity, we don't shy away from the opportunity. And I was able to serve my country in a very honorable fashion during that period of time while implementing a treaty without violating the treaty. Um, you know, we, so it was, it was a good experience. Then I roll into um, the war, the Gulf War. I told you I designed this computer system that was, that was so I'm supposed to go work for General Boomer. He wrote a by name request. He said, I want Ritter to come to my staff to help us finalize this plan to go. I want the guy who simulated it to come here and help us do it. Yeah, baby. So I get off the airplane in Riyadh. They don't have my orders. They don't know anything about me. And they say, well, go, go, go to the barracks and in the morning come in. And it turns out I wasn't going to to, to, to Mars Sent. I wasn't going to go do what Marines are supposed to do. They said, well, no, you're here. So uh, we can either send you home or uh, we'll find a place for you. So they put me in battle damage assessment. Uh, which, if you're a Marine, is the kiss of death. It means you're sitting behind a desk doing battle damage assessment, looking at photographs and all that. And you're just like, oh, God. But early on in the war, as Iraq started firing Scud missiles, um, General Waller, who's number two under Schwarzkopf, comes in. And they, somebody had heard that I'd, I was I was actually well-known in the intelligence community as a weapons inspector. They came and said, where's that missile guy? I was like, here. And I got pulled away, and I got plugged into this never, never land of counter scud operations. And so now I'm out there doing stuff, trying to kill scud missiles, working with really cool people uh, doing stuff. And I'm, I'm having this experience, yeah. um, but the, the experience, it's like uh, doing, a, doing a, a chess game long distance. My opponent is the Iraqis that are running the, uh, their scud campaign. And I'm back here trying to guess what they're going to do and trying to see, get to do things here, get to do things there, and all this kind of stuff. Again, as a junior captain, come on, man, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and again, I, I got arrested by Schwarzkopf. Uh, I got fired by Schwarzkopf. I got fired again by Schwarzkopf because I was controversial. I was saying things like, we're not killing any scuds because they were claiming all these scud kills they, week two, we killed 60. And I said, well, they only had 60 launchers. I said, they only have 19, and they're still launching. 
So you couldn't have killed 60. So we get into finding out why that happened. The Patriot missiles claiming to shoot him down, but I'm looking at the debris going, we didn't shoot it down and all that stuff. But so I was asked to falsify a report. I refused to do it. I got fired. It got picked up. Colin Powell saved my ass. He's the one who looked at it and said, no, Ritter's telling the truth. I got rehired. Uh, I got sent up to work with Delta Force to do operations across the border. I got accused of trying to start my own war. I was arrested, sent back, charged, released, accused, uh, recognized for doing a good job. They gave me a medal. The war ended. Long way of saying that I rolled into the United Nations with a pretty damn good reputation. Um, they hired me not at the start. At the start, it was supposed to be a gentleman's agreement uh, where you had these true experts, chemical experts, biological experts, nuclear right. experts, missile okay. experts, come in and verify an Iraqi declaration and then oversee the disposition of this equipment. But it became clear early on that the Iraqis were lying. Just to let the audience know at that particular time, because at Norwich with the Russian school, we were always talking about the United Nations and, and with civilian students. And they'd always say, you know, the UN really wasn't into uh, having Americans kind of do a lot of this type of work, you know, at that particular time. They didn't, you know, so you had to really stand out for them to kind of put you in there unless you were like a, you know, a, a real expert in something. So for, <laughs> well, it, I was brought in as an expert. I mean, yeah, that's what got me yeah. in. Um, yeah. And um, but at that time, too, the U.S. had just won the Gulf War. And this resolution that was being implemented was a U.S. driven a resolution. And the Russians, the Soviets were on our side at that time. So we had everybody working with us. So in this case, mm -hmm. the United States had a heavy presence, a heavy presence. The colonel, uh, the director of operations was the colonel that I knew in Russia. He was working in. I was on his team initially that went in there. Um, the, his operations officer, a lieutenant colonel, was an a inspector in Russia with me. And um, and they're the ones that realized about the middle of the summer that the Iraqis are lying. And one of the biggest things that they're lying about is their missiles. And so they were like, well, what do we do? And that's Colonel England, Doug England, a U.S. Army, said, we need to create an intelligence unit. And the U.N. was like, we don't have, we don't do intelligence units. We don't. Do that and he said well we're gonna have to they said well how do we do that and he said i'll bring in the guy that can do it and he called me up and um i was brought in i had just left the marine corps and i was supposed to go on to this this uh new career of uh, building uh food processing plants in the soviet union for hj heinz uh you know and make money and all this kind of stuff and the coup happened in august of 1991 and i was unemployed i'm actually filling out applications to the New Mexico State Police. And had he not made the phone call, I'd be writing tickets today uh, on Highway <laughs> and going across yeah. Highway 40. Uh, I'd be the most hated state trooper in the world because I would have been anal retentive about writing you a ticket. Um, <laughs> but fortunately, I got the phone call that said, you want to come and do this and do what? Create. Remember how you become an expert to be the first person to do it? To create the first ever intelligence unit in the We're United Nations. That. And I'm going to come in because why? One, I know arms control. I helped implement the first arms control agreement. I know on-site inspection. I wrote the book on on-site inspection. And I know Iraqi Scud missiles. I fought the war against Iraqi Scud missiles. So I'm coming in to do that job. And my focus initially was to create a, a, a capability and then turn that capability into operational support of inspections on the missile front. So I wrote, a, I wrote an analysis early on um, that when I assessed everything, I came out and I said, I think the Iraqis are hiding a half a dozen launchers and about 100 missiles. And everybody's like, how do you do that? And I had the paper and I said, this is how I came up with it. And there's people doubting, 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 doubting. And then we do a couple inspections. We do one in December. It was a great scud hunt. We had Delta Force on. We're out there looking for hidden missiles, didn't find anything. And we're going to do another one in March, another scud hunt. But because of the pressure of the December inspection, combined with the pressure the United States was putting on, uh, the Iraqis folded. And right before we went in, they confessed. They said, we were lying to you the whole time. And so we came in and they provided us with a new declaration. They declared six launchers and 98 missiles. So I was right on my assessment. So that gave me a lot of street cred at that point in time. And now we have to be in the business of verifying this. And this is where... I, I built my reputation because we did, um, I forensically attacked that problem. I said that, I said, we can't do this superficially. 
So we had to dig up all, they'd taken their missiles and they'd blown them up, and buried them underground. So we had to come in and dig up all these missiles. And then, and I remember that, because at that time I was still junior. I was just, I was the intelligence guy, but there was a chief inspector above me, Derek Boothby, good guy, British guy, but a UN official. And I'm like, we got to collect all the serial numbers. He's like, why? I said, trust me. And he said, no, that's too intrusive. I said, Derek, we're collecting all the serial numbers. And we did. We got every serial number off of every piece of equipment. Why? Because I have to take each one of those serial numbers and match it to a missile. Then I have to match that missile to a production record from, guess where they produce SCUD missiles? Vodkinsk, the same factory I was at uh, in Russia. The world's a small place. That's and, right, because they because they they were, um, the, the, the Iraqis were getting everything. Equipment for the show you. So, yeah. so, yeah. Wow, that, this is all, you know. Well, but this, so we're, this is like genius Forrest Gump. Uh, you it's know. weird stuff uh, uh, because, I mean, you know, I'm coming up with these ideas, but they're ideas driven by circumstance, not by me being some PhD guy. It was just well, logical. I, well, it's, I, I believe it's, uh, you know, that that Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour thing that is well, also. That's exactly what it was. It was, right? it was the fact that I had put so much time and effort into it. I was starting to able to see things that yeah. other people couldn't see. Yeah. And and so we do this. And um, and we're we're well on the way to do that. But then in the summer of 1982, um, we, we were looking for the archive. The Iraqis admitted getting rid of the missiles, but one of our concerns was that they held on to the archive of documents that could allow them to reconstitute this capability. They denied having the archive, but I was on the hunt for the archive. And the British had um, had a human intelligence source that had some data. And so I flew to London. We looked at the data and we identified some targets based upon this data and uh, we're going to inspect those. And we had one of these classic United Nations moments um, where I was also managing what we call the U. We had a U-2 aircraft. The U.S. provided us a U-2 spy plane. Yeah, yeah. So, Powers. Power. Yeah, carry Powers kind of stuff. And uh, it would go in and take photographs for us. But we had to, as part of the agreement, provide the Iraqis with notification of when the plane would enter Iraqi airspace. We wouldn't give away the flight path, but when it would enter and when it would exit. And then what it did in Iraqi supply space was up to them. But we had to give that notification in a timely fashion. I also had to prepare what's called notification of inspection site, which is the warrant for the arrest of the Iraqi inspection site that the, that the chief, that the executive chairman signs. It's a document that gives me permission when I go into Iraq, go anywhere I want, yeah. knock on the door. And when I produce that document that has the coordinates on it, say, you have to let me in. But it's a very, very sensitive document because you don't want the Iraqis to know about it. And so I come in with two folders that need the chairman's signature. One is the U-2 thing that's going to be signed and then sent to the Iraqis. The other one is the notification of inspection, which is going to be signed and given back to me. So I, I deliver it, come back, and I go, where's the, where's the notification? She hands me the folder. It's the U-2 thing. I said, no, this is the U-2 thing. Where's the notification? I sent it to the Iraqis. They said, you did what? You just gave away our sites. So we had to literally that night uh, fly. I got to fly the Concord. Uh, fly to London yeah, and take a plane, join up with the team in Baghdad, redirect the team to do this inspection. We were able to uh, to surround the site before the Iraqis responded, and it, the archive was there. We surrounded it. Was in the uh, was the Ministry of Agriculture, but they wouldn't let us in. Then we had a standoff where they literally surrounded us and they began escalating violence against the inspectors. And because we're not armed, um, when they started physically attacking inspectors, we had to withdraw. And when we withdrew, they evacuated the archive. Then later on, they negotiated so we could come back in. Another team went in, found nothing except empty uh, document places. But this, this inspection really pissed us off because we were let down by the Iraqis who lied to us, and we were let down by the U.S. government who failed to back us up. We thought that we we're going to go back to war, and the U.S. government didn't. Now the U.S. government turned to us and said, you've got to, it's your problem to solve. I said, well, how do we solve this problem? Because if we confront, confront the Iraqis, what they learned is that all they have to do is wait us out and you're going to back down. You put us in an impossible situation. So now I have to, instead of doing a standard inspection, I had to change the whole approach. And this is where you ask, how did I become what I became? Yeah. This is the process where I stopped being a junior intelligence officer and I became a um, a major player in the inspection operation because I designed a campaign that was that was intended to expose the totality of the Iraqi Missile Force. In order to support that campaign, 
It was intelligence driven. One of the things I did is um, in, in the summer of uh, 1991, uh, a nuclear inspection team had uh, seized the nuclear archive. We were looking for the missile archive. They got the nuclear archive uh, and they were able to get it out and it was in Vienna. So, but they treated it like gold. And the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, um, and the UNSCOM inspectors, we didn't get along. Our Swede hated their Swede. They were headed by Hans Blix. We were headed by Rolf Akeas, and They hated each other. They wouldn't talk to each other. They had a Greek name, Dimitri Karakos, who was the deputy, and he hated me. And Maurizio Zifferero distrusted everybody. I flew in to Vienna together with a Russian diplomat named Nikita Smidovich, brilliant man. And we sat there and we negotiated access. We had to negotiate access to that archive. And we went through it and we found information related to the missile program. So we were able to get those documents. Then we went to the Germans and we got we went to the prosecutors who were investigating German companies that had provided the Iraqis with technical support to build missiles. And we got the contracts of the different machine tools and everything. So we had all this information. We went to other places. We got financial documents and all that. And so I went into Iraq and my whole idea was that we're going to go to inspection sites that we knew about from these documents. Yeah. Turned up them, swarmed them uh, with a document search, and then you have the Iraqis say, "See, we told you, there's nothing here," and then hold a seminar where we sit down with the Iraqis, and now they're cocky because we just inspected their facility and there was nothing there. Then we said, start, "Start talking to the Iraqis about things." I said, "So, you know, I'll give you an example." Once I said, "So you had a uh, this, this computer controlled uh, numerical controlled uh, milling machine?" Oh yes, I said, it was "German technology." Oh, yes, Mr. Scott, great German technology. It was my baby. We did it, but you destroyed it. You destroyed my baby, and I'm still crying about it. I said, so that, that, that one we destroyed, that was it? Oh, yes, Mr. Scott. These were very expensive. I had the contract for five. And so I'm letting them commit. I said, and you're sure about it? I remember it like yesterday when it came. I said, really? Bam, there's the contract. Why does it say five? Is that your signature down there for receiving five? Where are the other four? You know, they didn't know what to do. Uh, so now they said, oh, I suddenly remembered, yes. Oh, they're over here. And so now we got to that. Now the Iraqis are looking at me like, holy cow. But now when I come to them, they're like, boom, boom, boom. And I'd set them up again. Oh, yes, Mr. Scott. But now they're not so cocky. Another document. Bam. That says you got three. You said you only had two. Where's the missing one? They have to take me to that. And we're going on and on and on. And it got so funny that near the end, because we had a list of questions that we had, we had documents for most of them. Some we didn't. And so at the end, Nikita's trying to tell me, that's enough, we're done. And I said, no, we ain't done. So we're, we're talking, and I'm, now I'm getting aggressive. I'm just staring at him. I said, what about this? What about that? No, no, no. What about, and I start reaching for the bag. Okay, Mr. Scott. They started confessing. And I didn't, because I didn't have a document. And I got him to confess. But we did that inspection, yeah. and it, it, it gave us a better understanding. So the next inspection was where I said, I have to interview the entire staff of uh, Iraqi Scud Force. Remember I told you about during the war, how I was in this long distance chess game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Demanding to meet chess players on the other side. Yeah. The commanding general, Hazem Ayubi, all of his brigade commanders, all of his regimental commanders, all of his company commanders. And we are going to go to every site where like, we replayed the war. Uh, every engage, I had Delta Force tell me where they killed Scuds, SAS tell me where they killed Scuds. And we went in there and we did the whole war. We refought the whole war. And it was a fascinating part because we had phase one of the uh, of the thing uh, where we met with them, and then we went out and inspected. We came back for the final meeting, and um, the Delta guys were saying they're lying. We know we killed a scud. And I said, "Well, how do you know?" And they said, "Because that's the guy that killed it." I said, "Okay, tell me." And they told me about the battle and all this stuff. So I had all the information in my head, and so I I confront the Iraqis. I said, "You're lying through your teeth. But none of this is true." And then. There was a seven hour period that was just pure magic. I pulled out this map of all of Western Iraq. And General Ayubi and I spent seven hours refighting the war, a map war, oh, wow. this day, that day. He said he did this. I said, bullshit, we blew up a bridge here. Uh, he said, no, we went around the bridge there. And the guys in the back that had the uh, imagery analysis, were not the imagery, but the writeouts of each bridge strike. I said, okay, bridge here, when was it bombed? This day, give me the readout. Yep, there was a bridge going across. They could get stuff across. Okay, so the Iraqis are telling the truth there. And we went through, we deconstructed the entire war, everything, how they logistically supported. Do, do you think that's, to, and I don't want to interrupt you, but do you think that softened them up to where later on you were able to leverage, you know, like 
enteric disease and stuff. Well, it like did that. because what, what happened on that one is, um, I mean, I, I, I called General Ayubi, who's a hero, by the way, twice decorated with their version of the Medal of Honor. He is like the from, guy. From, from the, from the uh, Iran, First of all, right. Iran Iraq War, and then he got another big medal for us. Remember, even though we beat Iraq during Desert Storm, he beat us. Oh, well, His missile force right. survived. All right. They, 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 we didn't destroy a single missile launcher. We didn't destroy a single missile. Wow. He was able to launch missiles up until the last day of the war. Wow. So from his perspective and the perspective of his guys, they won the war. You know, they, they their war, they won. They didn't lose. Um, you know, and so, you know, so they were a little resentful that we were coming in and dismantling their missile force and all that because we were. We were destroying everything. Uh, but so it was with pride that they were telling us this story. Yeah. But the long story short is um, – we got to that one engagement that the uh, that the Delta Force said we know we killed it right here, and I walked through it, and um, Ayubi was like, "No, we we didn't have anything there. We, all all our assets were over here. We had nothing in that area. I don't know what you guys killed." And they're sitting there going, "We killed it. Scud transporter erector launcher, Maverick missile in the middle of it. It split in two. I was there. I saw it there lying." And at that point in time, I could have walked away and said, you're a liar, and we're done. But I took it the next step. I took it up to, over over Ayubi's head, to uh, uh, General uh, Amir Rashid, who's the Minister of Oil at that time, but he was used to be the head of military industry. And I came to him, and, and you don't want to go to Amir Rashid, but I had come to him a week earlier where they had lied to us about producing their own Scud missile fuel. And I said, your numbers don't work up. And he, your numbers are killing our Iraqi children. <laughs> and I had my home, and I ran through my numbers again. Finally, I had to admit, yeah, you're right. Your numbers are good. Our numbers are bad. Calling his guys, and they admitted, yeah, we had a covert fuel production program. Scott Ritter's right on this, et cetera. So now I come to him and I say, we killed him. We killed a launcher. He said, no, you didn't. I said, we killed a launcher. And we talked about the engagement. He got on the phone. Well, we killed a launcher, but it wasn't a Scud launcher. It was a Roland missile launcher. It uses a vehicle that's very similar to what a Scud vehicle <laughs> looks like. So the Delta Force guys were directing the airstrike from about five kilometers away are seeing something that looks like a Scud vehicle. The Maverick pilot, or the A-10 pilot who fired the Maverick missile, thinks he's got it, uh, and it blows up and it looks like it, but it was a Roland missile launcher, not a Scud missile launcher, and we cleared it up. I took that to, uh, I came out of the, this inspection, I went to the Defense Intelligence College at the DIA, and I oh, briefed a group of about 90, uh, 90 of the top missile analysts in, in America. I said, we've accounted for everything. And I walked through my numbers. They freaked out. They were like, no, 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 you know, because medals were given for killing scuds, you know, and the whole special forces community was like, Ritter's foolish, you know, I mean, it's just bad. And this, we can talk about this later about what this all did to my psychology, because I'm a patriotic American. Now I have my country call me a traitor yeah. for telling the truth, for doing my job. Um, but the director of the CIA uh, went behind my back and briefed Congress and said, there's 200 scud missiles missing. And I'm like, I just told you that we counted for everything. And I talked about how we dug it up, all the missile numbers we went to Russia, da da da. da. We, we walked through the battlefield. We had it all taken care of. No, they said no, they have good intelligence that they hit missiles. So now the next summer, I have to build a new inspection capability uh, ground penetrating radar. I came up with the idea. I said, if you got buried missiles, we're going to build ground penetrating radar. And I went to the CIA. I said, you got to build it for us. So they did. We put it on helicopters. We practiced with it out in uh, California. Then we took it to Iraq. And we spent three months flying over Iraq, all these sites, digging up holes, looking for things. We found nothing. All the intelligence was bad. This time I go and brief the director of the CIA himself and all the people. And I say, we account for everything. And he said something there. He said, you know, that's interesting, but um, our number is 12 to 20 uh, launchers or missiles. And that number is never going to change no matter what you do. And that's what became apparent that the United States didn't want me to disarm Iraq. But my, my point is all that all that effort that I put in, the Iraqis realized that A, I was probably the most dangerous man in the world yeah. for them. Yeah. Uh, they called me Abu Azamat, father of all crises. Um, when I came in, there was a crisis. And I'm telling you, every time I came in with the team, I ended up at the Security Council where they talked about going to war. Saddam Hussein used to convene a national, an emergency national security uh, meeting every time my inspections came in because they monitored precisely what I was doing. But what they found out, because I would always, I, I tried to get to, for instance, to the Iraqi intelligence service headquarters. They're like, no, 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 no. I told the guy, I said, 
you know, you got to let us in. There's going to be trouble. They said, well, you want to spy on us. I said, no, I don't. I said, I know exactly what I'm looking for and all that kind of stuff. And when they let me in, I went straight to what I wanted, found what I was looking for. I evaluated. I said, it's not what we thought it was. Boom. And we left. He said, so you were telling the truth. I said, yeah, I always tell you the truth. I will never lie to you. You can, I can guarantee that when I say something, it is the truth. I'm not here to mislead you. I'm here to do an inspection. I can't tell you up front what I'm doing because that would disqualify the inspection. But the Iraqis learned to trust me. So when I said, so back in 1998, near the end of this, when they sent me to the Ministry of Defense to carry out the, an inspection that was supposed to go to be war, Tarek Aziz had said, if you inspect the Ministry of Defense, we're going to war. We won't let you in. So the U.S. government said, we're sending Ritter to the Ministry of Defense. And I actually had a meeting in the White House and then in the State Department, then at the ambassador's office um, and the United Nations of uh, Bill Richardson, and uh, where they planned it out. They said, you're going to inspect the Ministry of Defense on this day. We're going to have a crisis here. You're going to be evacuated here. And the cruise missiles are going to fire for a week. And I'm like, so I'm a trigger for a war. They said, yeah. I said, well, that's not really my job. My job is to be a weapons inspector. He said, don't worry about it. They won't let you in. So I show up on the site with my team and we get stopped at gunpoint. And uh, Amr Rashid <laughs> shows up. And he goes, what are you doing? I said, I got to get in there. He said, you can't. Uh, we, Tarek Aziz won't let you. Saddam won't let you. I said, if you don't, we're going to go to war. I said, I don't want that. He said, yeah, but that's the most sensitive part of Iraq. We can't let you in there. I said, I have to go in there. And I said, but you have to trust me. I know what we're looking for. I'm not here to spy on you. I won't let my guys spy on you. We have a job to do. Just let us do the job. And he called together the chief of staff of the Iraqi Armed Forces, all their generals, and we had a dinner. He called me in. We sat down. There's a meal. and We're sharing a meal and we're talking. And they're talking and I'm trying to explain what we want to accomplish. And finally, one of them turns to me and says, ask him about Israel. And Amr Rashid goes, um, have you ever been to Israel? Of course, Israel and Iraq, doesn't, they don't get along very well. And uh, I said, yes, many times. Because I had, from 1994 to 1998, I was the senior liaison with Israeli military intelligence to gather information to help our, our guide our own teams. But it was legitimate. I wasn't, you know, we didn't want to admit it, uh, but I, I had permission of uh, the executive chairman. I had permission of the CIA. Uh, I went to Israel, very close relationship, got good information that helped us investigate unknowns. And, and now we have knowns. So I said, yeah, no, I've been to Israel a couple of times. I said, they're like, well, why are you telling us? I said, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have asked the question if you didn't know the answer. And I'm not going to lie to you. I told you. I will never lie to you. Um, and then he's talking. You can see him all nodding like that. Then he gets up and he makes a phone call to Tarek Aziz. And he comes back and he says, okay, you can inspect the building. And I went in there and I inspect the building. While this was happening, Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, in Paris with her French counterpart bragging about how the fix is in. There's going to be a war. And she's like, I'm going to get the call pretty soon. She got the call, but it wasn't that the fix is in. The call was Ritter got in. They were furious. Uh, I was accused by um, the, the Clinton White House of uh, betraying my country. Um, they called me a, a, a traitor. They called me a, a, a threat to national security because I wouldn't uh, get us involved in a war. Uh, my job was inspections, not to start a war. I carried out my job. But yes, the question, why do the Iraqis trust me? Because yeah. I never yeah. lied to them. But I was the meanest, toughest son of a bitch that ever went into Iraq. But I yeah. never lied to him. And I was only there to do my job. And and yeah, and and I did I did tactical civil affairs and I in Iraq and what you said, they respect, and I'm not I'm not saying this about all Iraqis, but in the Middle East, because that culture, the terrain, the environment is so harsh that trust, you know, is yeah. essential. And you have to to convince people you have to be hard. Because that's a that's a hard world, you know. Just just yeah. surviving in the desert is hard, and so that you know what you say, I I, I connect with you on that because uh, I ver not verify, I I validate you on that. And I always told my inspectors, um, and remember, I was leading guys who uh, uh, my teams were really weird because yeah. I had to have real inspectors. I mean, I had to have experts. I had to have rocket scientists, chemists, biologists, nuclear scientists. They all have thin necks and white paley skin because they're indoors but i also had to have guys that uh, could do stuff um and they had thicker necks thicker arms and um and then i had people in between so i had these teams but i every team we went in every team i let in we had a delta force um component with us um 
to facilitate our rescue. We had to plan a hostage rescue mission for every team I sent in. Uh, so we had guys with beacons. We had to break our team down into different sub teams. So that if we got taken, you stay with your sub team leader, then, you know, Delta will come in, kill everybody, pull you out and all that kind of stuff. But that is the mindset. And some of these guys were just like, I don't want to do that. So I had to get up in front of every one of them and tell them, I said, you know, fear in front of the Iraqis is like blood in front of a shark. If you go in front of the Iraqis, they're going to try and intimidate you. They're going to bring out the guns. They're going to do all this. And the second they smell fear, they're on you. And it's over. Team's done. I've seen it happen with other teams. It will never happen with my team. I said, all I want you to do when we go into Iraq, I said, I am the alpha dog. I am going to go in there. I'm going to piss all over their wall. And if they come in and try to piss on top of me, I'm going to piss on top of them. That's what we do. When we leave a site, we want to pee all over everything, make them know that we inspected the site. But we're going to do it with respect. We're going, to come in, we're going to do our job and only our job, but we're never backing down ever once. That's what we did. We caught them rolling in. And the Iraqis, I told you, they feared us. They respected us. But they knew I never lied to them ever once um, that I that I tell them a lie. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that's I think, um, you know, I'm doing uh, this stuff at Columbia. And we were, we were talking about intercultural uh, dynamics. And I'm, I'm going to leave my classmates to watch this because and other videos that you've done. But I think this one, you know, is special to me because you got into the real micro uh details on a lot of this stuff that you were involved in that i think a lot of people would really be interested in as far as understanding um the the different things that you did that actually align with a lot of these different surveys and uh research studies on inner on inner uh uh cultural dynamics and so this is not only informative in regards to the military uh, affairs type of stuff that I'm really into that our vets are into, but also civilians. And, and I know, you know, I could have you here forever. And I think in, in the future I will, um, but not this time, but I wanted to ask you this, this question, what do you think in regards to uh, when people say right now, uh, oh, the recruitment, uh, the military, they can't get it because of all this wokeism. And, you know, you and I, I mean, I was, I was in the National Guard. I was, uh, I was Marine Anglico, but the only Marine Anglico jump unit, which was reserved, but people say, ah, just nasty reserves. Well, I got my jump wings and I got a lot of great training with that unit. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, and then, uh, and then I, oh, then during war on drugs, you know, I, I wasn't out there getting Escobar, but I, I was I, I was there during war on drugs as an officer, and it was an interesting time, you know. And then uh, then I became a monk for about ten years, a Catholic. Monk. Were you were you a marine marine officer during the war on drugs? No, no, I was a sorry, I was a Coast Guard officer. They took my uh, my direct. I did a direct commission. I, I was just as crazy as you. I I don't know. I graduated uh, from Norwich early because the Anglico stuff put me a year behind my class but i just made up I, I i made up for it all yeah and yeah yeah summer just, school and everything yeah 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 exactly exactly and so i i graduated early and then uh i just i just took took that commission in the coast guard uh during war on drugs and then i um then i then i went to yale for my master's and i studied i studied uh christian muslim dialogue and psychology of religion and then i became a monk for 10 years i just figured out oh, i'm just gonna meditate and and uh eat uh you know wheat grass and and, and pray the rosary and that was it until 9 11 and i just you know i was really intrigued by uh civil affairs so i got into civil affairs and that that's that's how i was able to deploy why i'm saying that is you know the military has gone through all these changes and you you and i have seen all these different changes uh, you much more than me but i remember first of all you know the, the the military was was always doing diversity training the military was always doing it always had problems but it was always recovering you know like when zumwalt changed its uh, his mos policy you know and then got people like me not to be stewards and opened it up 
that was better than uh corporate america you know what yep. i mean that yep. was better yep. than you know what i mean that was the example for corporate america to do its dei so-called wokeism stuff but Marir, military was a leader in that you know so my thing is you know some people they're saying oh uh military recruitment why do you think uh there's problems with military recruitment right now and that's outside whether it's true or not you know with this so-called woke military but but the, i like you because of the brass tax you look at a lot of different factors so uh, saying that that factor is true or false whatever that's one factor but what are maybe some other factors that that could be affecting recruitment right now in the military I think the nation has um, has evolved, and that doesn't. I, I, sometimes, it, maybe you could say devolved too. That's yeah, a, yeah, that's yeah. that's a that's a problem too. Uh, yeah. it's changed. Yeah, yeah. video uh, games and 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 and, and just the whole going outside. What, what what a concept of society is, uh, because you know the military is a service to society, and so. Uh, it, it's not necessarily something unless you come from a military family or you know military tradition. It's not something people that naturally gravitate to. Um, so you, it's it's one where you have to you you have to make a decision. I want to do this. Right. Now some of those decisions are driven by economics. Um, I want to go to college, so I want to I want to do this. Um, I can't find a job. The factory closed down. I'm going to go do this. I mean, there's there's that, but it's still the this is the important part. It's not, I want to do, it's I want to do this. I want to serve in the military. And, and the ability of the military to, to take you in, as you said, it was, we, we were diverse before diversity became a buzzword. Um, I mean, I, I was told in the, in, 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 you know, Marine Corps officer candidate school by the darkest Marine I ever met in my life, my platoon sergeant. Um, he said, I don't have black Marines. I don't have white Marines. I don't have yellow Marines. I have, I have green Marines. You all are green. You're different shades of green, but you're green. And if you don't understand that, you bleed red, you wear green. And I don't want to hear any of this. I'm black, I'm white, I'm this, I'm that. And it was just one of those moments. And then you treated everybody as a Marine. It wasn't, you know, he's a black Marine. He's this Marine. This was, you know, Staff Sergeant so-and-so. This was Corporal so-and-so. This was Lieutenant so-and-so, et cetera. Um, and it just, that was, that was, Second nature. Plus, um, I don't think there was confusion when I came in about who the enemy was. Um, you know, it was the enemy was the Soviet Union. The enemy was communism. It was just straight up. We knew what we were. This is Ronald Reagan's America, and we knew what we were getting into. And um, there were no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So everybody was sort of on the same page with that. Um, and. I just think that our social skills were so much better. Um, our, our ability to socialize with people, you know, because there weren't cell phones, you know, nobody lived looking at their cell phone all day long. Nobody was on the computer. We didn't have computers. Right. Uh, you know, so when we had a problem to solve in the Marine Corps, we brought people together and it was all face to face. Boom, boom, boom. And when I counseled you or when I was counseled, it was done in a little green notebook that then got hand typed onto you know a page entry into your file um if there was work involved in it um you know there, there and i i remember just a story when i you know when i was a u.n weapons inspector i was i went back to the marine corps for a little while um i was told by the cia that was the thing i needed to do um in, in order to get, regain the trust of my country we didn't get into the whole psychology of uh having your country declare you to be a traitor when you're doing the most patriotic thing in the world which you know, his li next, have to live show. next show, but, uh, but I, uh, I came back in the Marine Corps transitioned to something called Lotus notes, um, which is, is I, I was old school staff work, meaning that, um, I typed it up, I hand carried it. I gave it to the, the S one, the three, the four, and we had a staff meeting. We talked about it. I took notes, came back, typed it up, staffed it again. And we worked like that. And now Suddenly, there's this thing called Lotus Notes. You never left your desk. Ding! Somebody would write something. There's a Lotus Note. Now you have to bring it in. And then you have to, you know, add your comments to it. And then, ding! You send it off. And this thing would be staffed with nobody ever meeting. And I have to tell you, it's the staffing that makes it good because a bad idea is a bad idea. 
but it, it becomes a really bad idea when the S4 is looking you right in the eyes going, Ritter, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Get you yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. 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 With all full respect, we're full of it. Boom, 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 boom. Sure. Yeah. Oh, did we finish? Yeah. We type it up. It's done. Put the learn all out through that process of human interaction. Now you've taken the human interaction out. It's all staff work. And you finish the day and they say, well, it's been staffed. I'm like, it hasn't been staffed. Nobody talked to anybody. It was all done on notes. Uh, and you don't get any of the in-depth human interaction that makes this whole experience in life magical. I'm talking about not just in the military, but just life. I learned that talking to Russians. Imagine if my interaction with Russians was all done on online. It'd be completely different. Not yeah. sitting down with them, you know, sweating in the banya, putting back shots. Imagine with the Iraqis, if my difference was done, if everything was done on computer instead of on the ground in Iraq, um, you know, eating, you know, eating mas goof yeah. and uh, drinking tea yeah. and and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I learned about people, humans, um, yeah. and that was also in the military. There's this human connectivity. How do you recruit somebody from a society that doesn't have? Because the key thing about a recruiter is he's a human representation of a system you're trying to convince people who aren't programmed for that system to join. Wow. How do I get them to come in? And they're too busy, locked up in a different society where they don't talk, they don't communicate, everything's done. And I, I don't think the military translates well into this environment because if it tries to do that, it becomes very superficial, yep. very superficial. Yeah. And one of the problems Again, I'm not a psychologist, uh, and I don't play one on TV, and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but I, I will say this. Um, there's always been a struggle with veterans reintegrating into society. There always has been, because the military is so different from anything. And you can still, you can have, I had one of the best military experiences anybody could ever ask for. Yeah, I, I have trouble finding negative. It was just so positive for me. And I saw a lot of negative stuff, but each one was a learning moment that yes. taught me about myself, made me a stronger person, a better person, et cetera. But I understand there's people that don't have that. People come in and there are negative experiences. I fortunately never had to um, engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I never had to experience uh, a fellow Marine bleeding out of my, in my arms. I never had to you know, see a guy's brains blown out uh, that was a friend of mine and all that stuff. So that that could be true i had stuff but not like that um but you know, you know my point is my experience was very positive um but even with that positive experience coming back to society and realizing that and i don't want to use a bad word but they don't have a freaking clue they don't have a freaking clue about anything and it's not that i want to be put on a pedestal i don't right i don't even want to be appreciated i right. just prefer that you mind your own damn business what I, what I don't want you to do is talking about my experience as if you know something. Right, right. As if you have some special insight into what I went through, what I experienced, et cetera. Because you don't. Um, you don't have. I was asked, uh, there, was yes. a, 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 there was a play um, a, from a book, uh, The Things They Carried. Yeah. Um, a famous, uh, famous book about Vietnam War. Uh, and they did a play here at the in, at the Palace Theater in Albany. And so a local anti-war movement um, said, hey, we want to invite you some other veterans to come and watch it, then be a panel, and we'll ask you questions. And I watched it, and you know, I, I'm not, you know, I think I'm pretty well balanced. Um, you know, things don't, things don't throw me off kilter too much. But I, I watched that play, and I got a little emotional. I mean, I was just like, because some of the stuff hits home, because no matter who you are or what you are, there's things that... You put it put inside and you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, what? And, and the things that you minimize, like in the either yeah, you just and you. I mean, yeah, I'm a yeah, psychoanalyst no, no. with 30,000 combat trauma hours that I treated. And you're just the typical, they're guys that say different things that you don't know. And I don't care to know because that's your, that's your narrative. You know what I mean? And everybody yeah. has narrative. And so, yeah, but I don't want like some, someone from society like much like you said being the owner of my narrative that's right and so i'm watching this play and things are resonating yeah so it's no longer about me observing and talking about what i observed i saw it and it became very personal yeah very personal yeah and so i'm up there and they're they're asking me questions and i finally i turned to the platform and i said with all due respect i'm not going to answer any more questions 
I said, because frankly speaking, uh, you don't have a need to know. And even if I told you, you wouldn't understand. And it's a waste of my time. I said, there are things that are just too personal. And uh, I'll be the one that decides when I want to open up and talk about it. Not you. You don't get to sit here tonight and pierce inside me and try to pull things out that you don't understand because you think you know something. And I want, you, I want to stop you here because the audience, there's a lot of vets that come to me and write me and, and whatever, when they meet me, we, we talk and they're like, well, what do you do when people say, you know, uh, have you killed somebody or this or that? You just heard um, a good narrative that um, uh, Scott shared a, a more robust one, whereas I, in my own narcissism, I'll say, just read my memoirs, you know, <laughs> you know? Uh, but Scott gave you something. If you're listening out there, you ever get put on the spot, take this as like a case study from what Scott just said, you know, you get invited to an event or you whatever publish your, your, your piece or given a concert or just, you know, you're at Thanksgiving and, and you got, you know, that freaking father-in-law you know that that is grilling you just kind of go back to this uh video and check out what scott just said because i think he gives a more uh robust not a conflictual uh claim it's not that you're trying to hide anything it's not that i'm trying to hide something but it's what scott just said this is very important because this is what veteran etc is all about and i loved everything that we talked about today and and all about the military stuff but really you know you know as we end this is the essence of kind of what we're talking about and that's that we can all kind of have an exchange of narratives as far as from our um veteran experience whether you're a company clerk or you know tabbed out you know delta force person you've got a narrative and i think that what uh, Scott just shared is an example of how he, you can, in a healthy manner, share with people without giving them, you know, your whole soul because they don't they don't deserve that. To be quite honest, I mean, we honor them, but they don't deserve that. Yeah, well, that's that that's the thing. I I, I learned to respect every individual's story. Um, but it's their story. They own the story. They get to tell the story the way they want to tell the story. And it's not up to me to uh, to listen to it and say, yeah, but what you're really trying to say is uh, that it's like, no, what he said is what he said. And, uh, and the other thing I found out is um, the best way, at least in my experience, because I've, I've had to, you know, I'm not trained. I don't have the training that you have and all that. But I've been called upon in certain yeah, circumstances yeah. to try and, to and, talk and to you've me. Done a, you've, done a, you've done a great job to be a representative. And even, to be quite honest, and for you other veterans, I have a very close friend that, you know, the, the freaking guy. And right now we're, you know, we get into fights every other week, you know. Uh, you'll probably hear about it in the future. But this is a guy who, you know, he's a real Jesse James. I mean, he was force recon. He was a sniper. Uh, he was Persian Gulf War with the dune buggies and all that. You probably rode in them, and 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 he was uh, or, or something like that. But you know the real the guys are real you know hard as nails kind of guy. But sadly, you know he came back and they just threw him out there, and um, you know he got caught up with um, being a successful bank robber. You know, like he did like seven heists, successful ones, and I'm like. You mean, I said, I'm proud of you because at least, <laughs> uh, at least you weren't like those Rangers that tried it one time out in Washington and they all got busted, you know, you got away. I mean, he served his time. He did hard time and everything, but, you know, he got himself into recovery. He changed his whole life. He did everything. He did hard time, you know, and what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say to you is to the audience is if you're going through a tough time or if you've got like a a narrative that isn't you know maybe you know it's got its ups it's got its down recognize that all veterans have it you know a lot of us don't have it out there someone like you know my nickname for him is jesse james the real jesse james 
you the know, real Jesse James. The real <laughs> like Jesse that. James. And seven height, the guy gets away. Seven, you know, it was the eighth one. I think he was um, he was drunk and he got he, he just slipped. But you know, uh, but really a great guy because he recovered and everything, served his time, did everything. He's this biggest sweetheart. And again, sniper force force guy, incredible guy. But the the thing is, is that. You're a veteran. You served your country. And I'm saying this to everyone that's listening. And uh, take it from Scott, myself, and um, and others in that, you know, we don't have to apologize to anyone. And that our narratives are unfolding, that we are learning. I remember I got back and, and, and I saw a psych person. And she was like, uh, uh you know, you, 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 you got to tell me about your missions and stuff like that. And I was like, uh, to be quite honest, I, 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 I really don't remember. Um, she's like, you're, you're lying or something. And then, you know, I walked out of there, but it took a couple years for me to understand, okay, well, this is what happened. That's what happened. You know, I was pissed off with her years after and I was going to write her a letter. I still might. I think this, I think you being here, you know, kind of helped me think, maybe I want to write her and say, it took some time to remember certain details that I wasn't ready to tell you that that particular time, you know, and I don't feel that at that time I owed you anything and I don't owe you anything right now, but I'm going to give you some things, you know, and this is what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you, um, the things that I want to share with you because I was there and I have a certain reality that's tied to it. And I lost my family after I got back and uh, that just didn't happen, you know, uh, playing uh, video games, you know, in at, at the Starbucks at uh, Biop, you know what I mean? I mean, it, you know, so... Uh, I just appreciate you. I know I, I kind of stretched it out, but I, I wanted to use this ending as a constructive way to connect our veterans that are isolated, those that had, you know, coming from the shelter, maybe watching us from the shelter, maybe had, you know, served time or just were kicked out of their homes, gone through a divorce, and just know that you're that you did serve that you did you did do something a hundred percent i mean and as i as, as i said you know you did something that the vast majority of americans didn't do and wouldn't do and couldn't do um and the other thing is you know there's that old military saying no plan survives initial contact with the enemy and when you're in the military every day is initial contact with the enemy uh meaning that it's not a predictable life um there are things that happen that you you could not have prepared yourself for. And the idea that um, you're going to spend your life second guessing an event or a series of events or sequence of events that could not have been predicted. Uh, there were so many unknowns and you were being called upon to make decisions or react in, in, in a unique hyper pressure area. And then afterwards, what? You, you want other people to criticize the decisions you made, to think that they know better, and then you start second guessing yourself. Yeah. Um, you can't second guess yourself because you, there's no way you could replicate what what happened. That what happened happened. It was just this unique sequence of stuff that came together at that moment in time and created something. And sometimes that's a traumatic experience. But the the I just I, again I'm not a psychologist and maybe medically trained people are going to say Scott shut the f up man. No, 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 you're right you're right on and that's why but, I kind of didn't. But my thing is that, yeah can't you can't dwell on the undwellable. Um, and, I, and I'll give you it's just a brief example. Yeah. It's not it's not one from a from war per se meaning combat, but you know um, yeah okay I'll say yeah I I I. I you know, was in a phase of my life where I was going to blow my brains out. I was going to be one of those statistics. Um, but the reason why was that I tried to stop a war. I tried to stop the Iraq war. I had bought so much into because as a chief inspector, I took ownership of my um, 
of my job. Yeah. And I took to heart that my job was to disarm Iraq. And then when we were gonna go to war based upon people misrepresenting my information, saying that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and I knew they didn't, I knew they didn't. And I was trying to convince people, I was writing op-eds, going on TV, traveling around the world, and I put my entire soul into this thing to try and stop this war because as a Marine, I care about nothing more than my fellow Marines. I don't want them to go to war and die in a war. So I literally bought into this wholesale, wholesale, more than I should have. Because, I mean, one person can only do so much. But I actually, you keep using the word narcissism. I actually woke up in the morning and said, you can stop this war. You can stop this war. You have the power. You have the knowledge. You have the information. You're a Marine. You can stop this war. And I bought into that Marine mindset. I became very mission focused. And I so focused on it that when the war didn't stop, it destroyed me, literally destroyed me. And I went into a, a tailspin like you wouldn't believe. And, um, and in many ways, I'm trying to, you know, I'm still, I mean, you know this, you, know, you never fully recover. <laughs> there's always second guessing, there's always doubts, there's always things, but you put that away and you tuck it away and you do all that kind of stuff, but everybody has it. Um, and I don't know. I don't know where I was going with this, you know, except to no, say you're, that you're, uh, you're going, you're going with your trans one, your transparency. And I think in a lot of the different interviews you've done, this is a special interview folks, because like I said, come back to it for the military uh, information, but go to the end to talk about, to learn or relearn about military readjustment, because you're getting like certain testimonies here that are real. Scott isn't talking about, you know, Scott's talking about, uh, you know, being in the military and being exposed as a civilian and as a, a military person and family members going back decades. So he's talking out of experience. And, and so this is important. And uh, if it saves a life or if it touches a life or if it's able to kind of have someone rethink and, and gain a certain level of confidence in their life, then it's all well worth it. And so you don't need, uh, and that's why I dedicated myself. I'm not doing uh, clinical work anymore because of like what you said, it, it ruined me it, at the VA. You know, I became a whistleblower. I did the same thing. You know, I had the names of all the corrupt people you know, um, and, uh, you know, I was caught up, you know, you were caught up with this. I was caught up in making, uh, uh, those Kevorkian, I'm such a sick puppy, those Kevorkian, uh, death masks, you know, and, uh, and I just, uh, I was like you, man, it was like the mission, but you know, the thing is because we care, it was worth it. You know, we, we survived. It was worth it because we did it because we cared for people. So no matter, you know, losing our families or, or the things that happened to us, you know, as far as blowback from all that, still tied towards something very, very important. And that's why I think, you know, uh, I really, really, really deep down outside of all the military information uh, we got from this show, uh, it's a great way to end the show. And I, you know, I'd really love to have you back again you know to maybe you know talk about all this stuff again and some other things you know that uh you know regarding uh the different nuances in um the military as far as like how being part of the machine you know can kind of like little by little you know uh give you one message but not give you you know, uh, the right message and then how to deal with the media. You know, I, I'd like to also <laughs> talk, talk to you, you know, because we have veterans that have that struggle with the media. And so, you know, I know I could talk to you for hours, but I know we're going to end, but I want to say thank you. And if it's possible, can you give us some last words? And also, uh, I know like your books are intense, you know, very good way, how people can get in touch with your books, uh, your website, or any type of social media stuff that will inform you 
about the latest things happening in uh, Scott Ritter's life. Can you, can you, some last words and then that information? Sure. I mean, you know, I guess, you know, we'll talk about it later, but here, if I had advice for anybody, it's this, um, you know, at the darkest moments of my life, um, the fact that I got up the next morning, woke up and took a step forward uh, and then repeated that, repeated that, got me from where I was to where I am. Uh, there's a lot of struggle in between and all that, but, you know, I, I'm in a good space now. I'm, 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 I'm well adjusted. I'm happy. Um, I think I'm contributing. But, you know, that it wasn't an easy journey. It was a tough journey. And every veteran out there goes through the same thing. Like you said, it doesn't matter if you were a clerk, a baker, a candlestick maker, or, you know, Delta Force, Marchenko, all that. It, the experience is the same. It's a, it's a shared experience of service to your country. Uh, and, and unfortunately, sometimes a country that doesn't respect your service. Um, among people that don't understand the service. And it's, it's a constant struggle, but just go to bed at night, get up in the morning, get out of bed, take a step forward, repeat, rinse, wash, and, and do that. And it'll work itself out. I mean, you'll find a way to get through it. Uh, don't quit. Do not quit. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a website, scottritterextra.com. Uh, everything I write is on there. It's free. Um, you don't have to pay any money. There's no paywall. Um, if you give me a link to the show, I'll post it. It'll go on that so more people can watch it. But that's the best way to connect with what I do. Um, and um, and that's it. I'll, I'll, I'll continue to work. I'm, uh, I'm I'm getting a little long in the tooth, but uh, there's some years left. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll about, yeah. How about the books? There's there's also books you do, and then yeah. there's uh, certain magazines that you publish in and. Stuff. Well, that's all posted. The, the, the oh, book, oh, that's yeah. got that's it's all got... scottritterextra.com. I'll have a list of all my podcasts, all the, the articles, everything is be there. You can get and, it all there. And, and to order the books too. And to order the books too. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we talked about my time as a weapons inspector. Yeah. Um, and so you so I, I wrote a book now called Disarm in the Time of Perestroika okay. uh, that's about that experience. And um, I, I think it's a I think it's a valuable book. If you send me your address, I'll get you a, uh, I know the author. He'll sign the book for you and send it to you. Outstanding. <laughs> I, I, I'll show it to my wannabe girlfriend and uh, I, I, I get something. And she'll dump you in yeah. a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thanks a lot, Scott. You've been quite generous, uh, not just to me, but to others. Um, and uh, just, uh, I, I promote folks to, uh, I promote Scott in the sense that I want folks to be more exposed because right now we're dealing in critical times. And we also need guides along the way that give us, not that they're, not that we hero worship them, you know, in the VA, I always had a young therapist and I'd say, you know, when, when you come across a vet, don't hero worship, but pay attention because you can learn something and that's the valuable thing that you get from them. It's not worshiping, you know, the incredible life, but it's honoring them, the life, but the things that you learn from that, the things that I, like I said earlier in the show, the first thing that I said in the show, Scott is uh, so knowledgeable about this stuff. And I've been educated by a lot of great scholars in military studies that at times I have to really think, did I hear this from a lecture or from Scott? Because I don't want to ever, you know, get sued. No, I'm just kidding. I don't ever want to, you know, disrespect the man for the incredible knowledge that he has. And uh, we're just honored for that. And uh, I used to be a preacher. That's why I'm long-winded. And that's why I have the this ending that I have. But uh, I appreciate you for being here on Veteran Etc. And hopefully you can join us again uh, in the future. And uh, thank you so much for everything. All right. Okay, well, thanks, thanks for blessings. having me. Yeah, and blessings to you and your family. Uh, enjoy spring and uh, enjoy them doggies. Yep. <laughs> thanks. Later. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Take care. Veteran Etc. invites you to join us again with your host, Mike Kim, every Sunday. If the content from this podcast is informative to you, 
please share the podcast with others. Give a like and or post something you learned from the episode on social media. If interested in other truly informative podcasts like Veteran Etc., check out ComingHomeWell.com for a listing of other veteran-based podcasts. Thank you for tuning in.